Well, good morning, everybody. For those uh, following our uh, meeting online, um, I'm Councillor Spencer Flower, leader of Dorset Council and chairman of the meeting. Welcome everyone to the first cabinet since March and certainly our first formal meeting to be held virtually using Microsoft Teams Live. Modern communications technology is great and what we would have done without, these, without it in these challenging and unprecedented times. However, as we, I think we all probably agree, there's no substitute for being in the room together. We've all learned a great deal about holding informal meetings and one to one conversations virtually using Teams or Skype. Holding formal meetings in public bring with it the need to be especially particular about how the meetings are conducted. As chairman, can I ask councillor colleagues, both the cabinet and those who have, who have asked to, to, uh, questions to stick to the agreed procedure? And for that, I thank you in advance. Can I remind all councillors and officers each time you speak? to begin by saying who you are and what your role is. That will help everyone following our meeting today. Before I formally open the meeting this morning, I'd like to draw attention to two standing items on the agenda. Agenda item four, public participation. And agenda item five, questions from, from members. Statements and questions have to be about council business. But we've received two statements for this meeting concerning community hospitals. The future of community hospitals is not something that is decided by this council. Concerns about community hospitals should be instead directed to the clinical commissioning group who have responsibility for clinical provision in Dorset. In a moment, I'll ask Laura Miller to comment further on this matter. We've also received a statement rather than a question from a Dorset councillor on the same subject. Again, this is a matter for the clinical commissioning group rather than the council and the members been informed accordingly. The main item of the business on our agenda today rightly concerns the work of the council in response to COVID-19. As the statements about community hospitals go beyond the scope of the council's own responsibility to COVID-19, I've accepted advice not to take these statements at cabinet today and the individuals concerned have been made aware of that. Dorset Council has no ability to reopen clinical service reviews, which is referred to the Secretary of State and decided upon with the benefit of advice from an independent review panel. Attempting to reopen decisions made about the clinical services review will only distract from the more important business of reviewing the council's response to the COVID-19 emergency and making sure that our response is as effective as it can be. In addition, and on the same subject, um, we received an email containing statements and questions, but it went into quar the quarantine box. And it wasn't seen by officers until yesterday afternoon. As it was too late to prepare a response, we will address these points that have made, been made in the email outside the meeting, and I'll make sure that everybody who's named on it uh, receive a copy of that response. Over your scrutiny councillors, with their wider experience and knowledge of Dorset's communities, who play an important part in reviewing the appropriateness of the council's response to COVID-19 emergency. That is why the recommendations to cap the cabinet is that the report should be referred to the Resources Overview and Scrutiny Committee for further consideration to further consider Dorset's Council's response to the emergency. I'm now going to hand over to Laura Miller to comment further on the question of community hospitals. Laura. Thank you, Chair. Um, Laura Miller, Cabinet Member for Adult Social Care and Health. Um, I will keep it brief, um, as I know we've got quite a lot to get through today. Um, I just really wanted to touch on um, this I suppose this campaign uh, for Dorset Council to in some way campaign for or to become involved with the request to reopen the community hospitals. Um, over the last seven weeks, we have seen a phenomenal amount of work done by Dorset Council officers, um, councillors, volunteers, um, and we're going to talk about that in detail later. Um, so I won't really go into that except to say that I understand where this comes from, people want to ensure that resources are maximised um, when we're in times of crisis. But for me and for my teams, our focus has been on the provision of social care. That's our statutory duty. Um, that's what we need to do. And that's our ongoing focus. I've got a question later um, about the care hotels that we've been using. Um, and whilst I appreciate that may have conflated the issue, um, I, I do understand that. It's not up to Dorset Council to be able, as you've already said, Chair, 
to uh, countermand those decisions that have already been made um, by our colleagues in the health system. And I just think that's really important to stress. Our duty is to ensure social provision, social care provision to free up that capacity in our acute hospitals. That's what we've done. The decision around the community hospitals, they are hospitals. They are not care provision. They are not social care provision and therefore not under our remit. And that decision rests with our colleagues in health. Um, and so that's really all I wanted to say was just really to stress those points. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Laura, uh, for, for that explanation. Um, I think it would be in the interest of, um, I don't seem to be live. Am I live? We can hear you. You yes. can hear me, okay. Thank you. I, I can't see whether I'm live or not. Um, I think it would be useful for the all the participants and all the, the public hopefully listening in today for us to do a bit of a roll call so that everybody knows who people are. I know we're going to, I've asked for um, colleagues, whether they are officers or members, to say who they are and what their roles are as they get involved in the uh, in the various reports. But initially, can I just um, start with Peter Wharf and ask Peter and then perhaps he can pass on to, to an I'll to the next person. So who are you, Peter? <laughs> Good morning, Spencer Chair. My name is Councillor Peter Wharf. I'm the Vice Chair of the Cabinet and Deputy Leader, and I hand over to Tony Alford. I don't know quite where Tony's gone. So can I'm I hand, gonna, sorry, can I'll I hand over to Ray I'll Bryan? Deal with it. I'll deal with it. Peter Wharf, right, Tony a... Alford. Are you there, Tony? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, I'm Anthony Olford and I'm the elected member for the Egerton Ward and I am a cabinet member uh, with the responsibility for uh, commu customer, community and regulatory services. And I pass over to Ray. Yes, I'm Councillor Ray Bryan. Uh, my portfolio is for highways, travel and the environment. And I'm going to pass over to Graham Carr-Jones. Uh, good morning. I am Graham Carr Jones. I'm the housing portfolio holder for Dorset Council. My portfolio also includes community safety and um, com uh, emergency planning. Tony Ferrari, uh, finance portfolio for finance, commercial, and assets. Laura. Laura Miller, um, cabinet member for adult social care and health. Andrew. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Councillor Andrew Parry. I'm Dorset Council's Cabinet Member responsible for children, education and early health. And I'm passing over to David Walsh. Good morning, everyone. My name is David Walsh. I am Cabinet Member responsible for planning. Thank, I'll now hand over back to the Chairman. Thank you very much, David. Um, I think it will be also appropriate uh, uh, to introduce for the officers to introduce themselves who were involved in <coughs> what's going on today. So can I start with uh, Matt Prosser, the Chief Exec? Yes, good morning, everybody. My name is Matt Prosser and as uh, the leader has said, I'm the Chief Executive of Dorset Council. I'll hand over to Aidan Dunn. Hello, uh, my name is Aidan Dunn. Uh, I'm the Executive Director of Corporate Development and the Council's Section 151 Officer, essentially the Finance Director. <coughs> if I could hand over to Jonathan Mayer. Good morning, I'm Jonathan Mayer. I'm the Corporate Director for Legal and Democratic and the Council's Monitoring Officer, essentially the Chief Legal Officer. Thank you and I'll hand over to um, John Selbrun. Good morning, I'm John Selgren, Executive Director for PLACE. I'm handing over to Teresa Levy. Good morning, I'm Teresa Levy, Executive Director for Children. Um, I lead the Community Shield and the Safety Cell work. We hand over to uh, Vivian, please. Thank you, sorry, thank you. Good morning, I'm Vivian Broadhurst. I'm the Exec Director for Adults and Housing. Kate, say who you are, so that you know, please. Good morning, Chairman. My name is Kate Critchell and I'm the Democratic Services Officer for this meeting. Thank you. Karen? Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Karen Punchard. I am the Corporate Director for Place Services. Good morning. 
Morning, Matthew. Do we have Matthew? Uh, good morning, uh, Matthew Bolter, Head of Commercial Waste and Strategy for Dorset. Thank you, Susan. Good morning, Susan Ward Rice, Diversity and Inclusion Officer. Thank you. And we we got a couple of colleagues from Comms. Jen. Good morning, Jennifer Lewis, Communications. And Claire Lodge. And we got the last but not by no means least, we've got um, Susan Dallison, uh, who's producing today, and Hayley Caves, who's the meeting also the meeting producer. So welcome to both of you. Um, Good morning, we, Chairman. What we have got live with us, a chairman of the um, scrutiny committees, and if they are allowing me, I'll say who they are. Um, Councillor Jane Somp of People, Councillor Jill Haynes Health, Councillor Dowell Turner Place, and Councillor um, Piers Brown Resources. And we've also got Chairman of Audit and Governance, um, Councillor Matt Hall. Um, and we've got a couple of other members who have asked to speak, um, uh, Brian Heatley and Nick Arland. So I'm now going to go to um, apologies for absence. And I, I am, I'll take this one if I may, um, uh, Kate. Gary Suttle, unfortunately, can't be with us today. He's a cabinet member. Um, he isn't with us today because sadly it's his mother's funeral and he's allowed me to say that. Otherwise he was certainly would have been here and he's desperately sorry that he can't be, but you know, we've told him to put his family first to, this morning. So I'm sure we'll all understand that. Uh, moving on to the minutes of the meeting held on the 3rd of March. Goodness me, that seems a long time ago now. Colleagues, when I'm able to, are we, are we content that I can sign those as a true record? Yes. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much. Um, declarations of interest. I haven't been informed of any, so if anything crops up during the meeting, then you just need to make me aware of it. But I think we've been through that, so hopefully that'll be OK. Public participation. We've now got some. Um, four questions and the questions are going to be read out by officers and the answers are going to be given by members. So the first one, the question is from Chris Bradley and Matt Prosser, I think is going to read it. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Spencer. So <coughs> Matt Prosser, Chief Executive, reading this question on behalf of Chris Bradley. Could the Cabinet please advise, is the Council satisfied that sufficient PPE, that's personal protective equipment, is available to fully safeguard all Dorset staff? whose work places them at risk of contracting COVID-19 or becoming carriers. If not, then what is the council doing to ensure that for their own staff and through NHS partners, that NHS staff, that PPE, personal protective equipment, is available to fully safeguard all staff whose work places them at risk of contracting COVID-19 or becoming carriers? And I believe Councillor Graham Carr-Jones is going to answer the question. Thank you, Chairman. Graham Carr Jones, Portfolio Holder, Housing, Community Safety and Emergency Planning. Tragically, COVID-19 has claimed the lives of many thousands of people worldwide, and I would like to extend my sympathy to all of those in Dorset and further afield who have lost a loved one. I would also like to extend thanks to all of our staff, whether you are caring for the elderly or vulnerable or keeping other vital services running, I thank you. Dorset Council does not run hospitals. Therefore, I cannot answer questions about the availability of PPE within the NHS. I can only answer for Dorset Council and reply that the Council has worked hard and has secured PPE for Council workers and the non-NHS partner organisations which have not themselves been able to secure sufficient supplies. I am grateful to central government which has provided some supplies of PPE to the Council. With the help of military planners, we have distributed these supplies fairly amongst our own services and partners. The Council has supplemented these supplies by investing very significantly in buying PPE to support key workers across Dorset. Whilst it is easy for the questioner to make a generalised remarks about staff being at risk by working in cramped conditions where social distancing is not possible, be assured we are working hard to protect all of our staff. Whether, whatever their roles, where it is possible to do this, the staff are working from home. Other staff are making 
uh, are in frontline services where they cannot work from home and managers are making sensible decisions about how to apply national guidance on the use of PPE to keep service users and this, our staff safe. We have systems in place to monitor our stocks and uses of PPE and guidance on the usage of PPE can change, but we hold sufficient stocks and we will continue to buy more on an ongoing basis. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Graham, for that. I'll move on to um, a, a question from uh, Kaz Dennett, which Jonathan Mayer is going to read. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Jonathan Mayer, Corporate Director for Legal and Democratic. I'm reading a question from Kaz Dennett, um, who submitted her question on behalf of Extinction Rebellion. I won't read the full preamble to the question, which is in the committee papers. Uh, the question is, what provisions are there to enable full council meetings to take place as scheduled on 14th May, 16th July? And should some COVID restrictions remain, 15th of October 2020? Can we expect these meetings to take place through a virtual platform as required? If not, what would prevent this? Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Well, thank you very much for the question because it's an important topic. It's important that democracy should continue and that we're doing this by having a meeting today, using the freedoms and flexibilities given to us by government to hold virtual meetings. Will we continue to hold uh, virtual cabinet meetings as well as uh, virtual meetings of overview and scrutiny, audit and governance, area planning committee and the licensing committee so that we can decide items relating to COVID-19 as well as business as usual. There will be a meeting of the full council on the 11th of June, but with the agreement of group leaders, this will be a reduced meeting to deal with procedural business only. And the other full council meetings you mentioned in your question will not be held as originally planned. It was also agreed that the annual council will now take place on Thursday the 3rd of September at 6.30 in the County Hall a council chamber, subject, of course, to government guidance around COVID-19 nearer the time. The cabinet and most of our committees have a membership of 10. Whilst it's practical to hold a virtual meeting of that size, there's a great deal of work to be done before you could contemplate running a virtual meeting involving 82 councillors. Thank you very much for the question. Can I ask um, Matt Crosser now to do, read the question from uh, Debbie Monkhouse? Yes, uh, thank you, Leader. So the question from Debbie Monkhouse uh, on agenda item seven. Residents are concerned that any democratic deficit that has arisen during the COVID-19 crisis is urgently addressed to ensure that there is a democratic accountability for the urgent decisions that the council is making. At full council on the 18th of February 2020, councillors overwhelmingly agreed that to provide the council with the good governance arrangements needed to enable the council to be effective and efficient and achieve its ambitions for Dorset's communities, member led and governance light. The existing scrutiny committee structure would be replaced in May with a framework more suitable to meet these aims. Could the council leader please explain why these new committees don't seem to be being established, given the importance of policy development and scrutiny, especially given the circumstances we find ourselves under? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the question. Um, the council's new governance arrangements are important to me, uh, so much so that I presented them to the last council meeting and moved that they should be adopted. Uh, that makes it all the more disappointing for me that the implementation of the new arrangements have had to be delayed. In ordinary times, the council is required to hold an annual meeting um, at which time the chairman of council, the leader and the committee chairman and so on are elected. The annual meeting is usually held in May and involves all 82 councillors. Our new structure would have been introduced from that annual meeting on the 14th of May when councillors would have been elected to chair and appoint to serve on our new committees. As a result of the exceptional times, we find ourselves in the government have made regulations re removing the need to hold an annual council meeting. There's still much uncertainty around the duration of the lockdown and social distancing measures, but I don't anticipate a full council a meeting will make to make appointments to our new structure will be held before September, in fact, the 3rd of September, as I mentioned earlier, 2020. This delay to implement our new committee structures will not 
will not, however, prevent scrutiny of the Council's response to the COVID-19 emergency from taking place. And I hope that later in the meeting, the Cabinet will accept the recommendations that we refer the Council's response to COVID-19 emergency for scrutiny by other councillors. Thank you very much for the question. Now I move on to um, um, Irene Statham and Jonathan Mayer is going to read the question. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. This is a question from Irene Statham of Extinction Rebellion. Again, I won't read the preamble, which is in the papers. The question is, when and through which channels will Dorset Council publish and implement its climate and ecological emergency strategy and action plan? Yes, uh, this is Councillor Ray Bryan. Um, I'm the chairman of the Climate and Ecological EAP, so I'm responding to this question. First of all, thank you for the question. Many of the points you raise are very important as we continue to move forward on our climate and eco ecological emergency strategy and action plan. When COVID-19 hit us like an express train without warning, we as a council acted in a speedy and if I may say well organised way. We used all our fantastic staff to ensure that those in need were looked after. But of course, to do that, we needed to identify who we needed to help. COVID-19 didn't come with a list of those in need. We had to pull our resources and that included all areas of my portfolio. Staff who worked in highways were moved to set up food distribution and PPE distribution, delivering food to the most vulnerable. Environmental staff also took on new tasks. Dorset travel team had to make sure the children who had to get to school got there so parents could carry out their jobs as key workers. We initially had over 60 people um, helping create our strategy and action plan. Then COVID-19 uh, arrived and we had to prioritise that work. Mid-April, we saw the return of some of those staff and were able to continue with the strategy and action plan. Our planned meeting in April was cancelled as we needed to catch up on the work we were doing before COVID-19 hit us. I would hope that no reasonable person would blame us for dealing with COVID-19 as a priority. Last week, the leader announced that due to the immense pressure of work, EAPs would have to be put on hold. But due to the importance of the climate and ecological emergency, resource would be found for that EAP to continue. The climate and ecological emergency strategy is in draft form and will be presented to the EAP at our meeting later this month. This gives all members of the EAP a chance to have their say in what we plan. And if agreed by the EAP, changes will be made to produce the final version. Members will be given different sections of the plan to ensure we keep track reducing our, on reducing our carbon footprint. You refer to the original proposals from councillors Turner and Clayton. Much of what they have requested is in the draft strategy. We had hoped to bring something to council mid-year 2020. We aim to bring a report to council at our next full council meeting. This will include dates to be achieved. We are in touch with other councils on a daily basis. Many are having to reappraise their strategy given the current circumstances. Meetings nationally are taking place via digital communication. I am pleased you mention our Dorset corporate plan and the fact that we made the climate and ecological emergency at the center of the plan. Nothing has changed on that. All your concerns are noted and I will take this opportunity to put your mind at rest. This council takes the declared climate and emergency very seriously. Thank you for your question. Back to you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Ray. Um, we're now going to move on to uh, questions from members. And the first question is from Councillor Brian Heatley um, to read his question and Ray Brian will respond. Brian. Hello, I hope this is working. I can't see myself, so yeah, I'm We concerned. can hear you, Brian. OK, thank you very much. I won't read the whole question. Uh, this is about people who run commercial businesses with boats from our harbours. Uh, many of those businesses are not eligible for the small business grant scheme because they don't pay business rates. Although the government has done something for the fish commercial fishing businesses, um, 
there are many others that are important to our tourist industry. I think the council should consider either waiving or reducing its harbour dues and berthing for fees rather than just deferring them to it is suggested to make special help for this particular group. Ray's going to respond. Yes, um, it's Councillor Ray Bryan again and uh, Brian, thank you for your question and I share a lot of your concerns. We know the immense pressure that business owners find themselves in as a result of this unprecedented situation. And we have been feeding back to central government that some of our Dorset businesses fall through the gaps of support being offered by them and the small business grants currently available. We and our local MPs have been lobby lobbying central government to support businesses that are ineligible for the newly introduced grant schemes. Our advice is that commercial businesses operating from our harbours should continue to monitor the various forms of assistance to determine their eligibility for small business grants and other government support as these may change, such as the bounce back loan scheme launched this week. As you are aware, Dorset Council is under extreme financial pressure at this time and, it and will be for the foreseeable future. There are hundreds of businesses across Dorset who do not pay business rates and are in a similar position to the charter boat businesses that you, that you name. Dorset Council are not in a position to provide support to all of these businesses. This is a national problem being experienced by other harbour authorities and wider groups of local businesses. Local authorities are helping to deal with the impact of COVID-19 in as many ways as we can, working to support central government policy. For commercial berth holders, we are however offering a payment deferral of up to three months and will continue to monitor the situation and any changes to government support. Thank you for the question. Thank, thank you very much, Ray. Uh, we've now got um, Nick, next questions from uh, Nick Ireland. So Nick, would you like to ask your question, please? Yeah, it's Councillor Nick Ireland, Crossways Ward. Um, I should probably point out that this question was uh, drafted before the agenda was changed. So in the COVID-19 report, agenda item seven, it states that under 13.14, that, and I quote, the financial impact of COVID-19 on Dorset Council's budget has been significant including renting and converting a hotel into a hospital. Yet available capacity in our acute hospital, Dorset County, is currently significantly much more than anticipated, and our community hospitals are equally underutilised. Given that the facility provided by renting hotels was designed to take the now unrealised pressure from our hospitals for apparently only non-medical discharges, and that my previously asked question as to set up costs for this hospital was an answered what has been the total cost so far of this seemingly unnecessary facility and what is the average occupancy rate in percentage terms so far? Laura. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Nick, for your question. Um, yes, it's important to note that the word hospital um, should not have been used. It's, it's a care facility, not a hospital. So following the COVID specific directives that were issued in March by the Department of Health and Social Care, the Ministry of Housing, Communities, Local Government and the LGA, the NHS and Dorset Council led the rapid response to commission services to enable the safe discharge of people with non-COVID-19 diagnosis who are medically ready from hospital as per the requirements of the Pathway 1 guidance. So the purpose of the rapid discharges was to enable hospital capacity to be maximised, to manage the predicted COVID-19 demand, and this in turn would protect the NHS capacity and save lives. So we were required to deliver additional capacity and local authorities across the UK established many arrangements with businesses that included hotel and hospitality com companies to enable this without impacting further on the existing social care capacity, which was and continues to be under pressure. Um, Essex County Council notably booked in excess of 300 beds for this purpose within hotels. The service was to support our residents to optimum recovery, therefore enabling them to return home or to further assess their needs and put in place appropriate support. We had an excellent response in providing this capacity so quickly and gave confidence across the system, which I cannot stress the importance of that. Um, you know, go back seven weeks ago and giving that confidence across the system was so important. 
uh, the business community pulled together to provide agile response and the aim was to increase the capacity for those leaving hospital who couldn't return home immediately and provide an alternative additional care provision. The fact that this capacity has not been needed at scale to date is really, really positive. This pandemic is unpredictable and I'm glad that we haven't needed it. So just onto the figures, um, as we've advised uh, previously prior to Cabinet, we're paying a weekly rate of £1,582 per bed. However, the project is being funded by Dorset Council and the CCG um, from the COVID-19 funding. So this equates to an estimated cost of £587,987 for a 12 week period. So the care hotels were commissioned um, in response, as I've, as I've messaged uh, previously, to instructions received from central government to support pathway one in terms of the hospital discharge. And it's essential, um, and this is why I'm grateful, Nick, for the question, um, because it's essential that we remember that whilst a lot of people are talking about reaching the peak, um, in reality, this is much more complex. Um, so guidelines in terms of infection control, and PPE, um, they're changing, and this will impact the ability of residential care sector to respond um, and will likely necessitate an increase in demand for temporary isolation facilities for those people without a positive diagnosis. And I think the, the last thing that I would stress is that as the crisis continues, the ability for uh, carers to receive urgently needed respite will also increase, and the council's working to make sure that the hotel capacity can also be used to provide valuable support to enable unpaid carers um, who have had a particularly challenging and difficult time during um, this period to carry on caring for their loved ones. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Laura. The eagle eye will notice that I've now wired myself up because I think there might have been a slight issue about hearing everything I was saying, so I hope this is clearer. We move on to agenda item six now, the forward plan which all the cabinet will be aware is a rather iterative document. It changes month on month as other things come in and we, we look at uh, timelines around things and the, the eagle eye will have probably spotted that as yet we haven't got anything in there about uh, the reset and recovery after COVID, but there will be something in and we'll, but when we see the next version of this, there will be some timelines in there because it's a piece of work that we've now started, very important piece of work, for recovery beyond where we are and sure. um, so that that's what will happen next time round. so we're, all we're doing this morning is accepting uh, the forward plan as it's set out in the uh, in the agenda papers members all content um content i'm just um aware of there might have been yeah. supplementary questions chair i wasn't oh, sure. sorry is there i i, 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 forgot to I didn't hear no. one so i i no. assume there wasn't no sorry no. nick Did no you the want to... fine i forgot yeah. to check yeah, well, I did, I did say I was going to ask when yeah, I submitted okay. my original question. I, um, thank you, Laura, for the answers. I just wanted to know, um, I think you might have alluded that the, 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 the contract is time limited. Uh, so that's my first supplementary. And the second is, um, was there a tendering process or was it just commissioned directly? Um, thank you, Nick. Um, I'm not quite sure what the first question was. It's um, time limited because of the funding um, being time limited and the, and the you know, we, we have a set period um, for the COVID um, response, um, we will obviously re revisit that if it need if it appears that we need that extra facility for, um, for example, respite. Um, then we would we would respond and react as we need to do for that. Um, I, for the tendering question, I'm going to thank you for it, and I'm going to ask if Tony Meadows can give you a little bit of background. Um, I think he's on the call as well, Tony. Hello everybody, uh, Tony Meadows, Head of Adult Commissioning. Um, in terms of the commissioning process, uh, I think as uh, Councillor Miller has uh, mentioned previously, we were working at quite significant speed. So in terms of a formal process, um, obviously we're going out with uh, specification, uh, opening up to the full marketplace, etc. Um, time didn't allow that because the, the, the mechanics of actually doing that process can take uh, weeks from that point of view. We did utilise our Dorset Care Framework, so we do have a list of providers, but the other side being um, when we actually looked at the levels of uh, ability within um, residential care homes, for example, to potentially utilise some of that space, 
Um, we also have to look at that, at the potential risk of that, because again, very limited capacity, issues with staff um, within care homes actually being available. Um, so we actually looked at a number of options. Um, again, it wasn't just a case of we had one approach. We had several approaches from local businesses and other providers to actually look at what we could do. But around that, we also had to look at the location. One of the key elements with this was ensuring that where um, obviously we were putting any resource, that we were enabled to actually get a staff resource and potentially even accommodate them, which was the case in this scenario because we didn't want to detract from the existing workforce. So in terms of the answer, no, in terms of a formal process, um, we, we covered it in terms of due diligence, in terms of contractually, in terms of our care framework. Um, we obviously looked at the available options and in terms of procurement, again, at a time of crisis, uh, we have to react accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, you can turn. Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Very comprehensive. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. On mute, Spencer. I said we thank you very much, Nick. I'm sorry. Apologies for this slight oversight. Um, we've dealt with the forward plan, so um, so I think we'll move on now to um, really the main item on the agenda this morning, which is the response to the COVID-19 uh, crisis. <coughs> Um, before I do that, I just wanted to reflect on um, perhaps a moment of reflection on the fact that um, sadly, 107, as of yesterday, 174 um, uh, people in Dorset have lost their lives, of which 46 are from care homes. Uh, and it really is a sad moment. Could I just ask you all just for a moment of reflection before we move on um, to the to the item on the agenda? Thank you. Right. Th thank you very much, everybody. Um, I thought that was a very appropriate thing to do this morning. Um, members, this is probably one of the most important reports to ever come before Council. We must surely not be distracted today from the focus of the key work this Council has been involved with during the past six weeks or so, as the country deals with the devastating impact that COVID-19 pandemic has had on all our lives. There is no doubt in my mind and I'm aware this is shared by members across the chamber, that the response from Dorset Council, Dorset Council officers to this crisis have been absolutely magnificent. Even the use of such words seem inadequate in describing just how well this council has performed in dealing with the coronavirus crisis. We must also remember, of course, that to be reminded daily that the crisis is yet to pass. The COVID-19 report before us this morning is a timely reminder of what we've achieved and what the key challenges will be going forward. It's been well documented that this crisis is having a devastating impact on our finances. And whilst we've received some government support as promised, further support will be needed. Before I invite cabinet colleagues and officers to contribute to the presentation of this report, can I just take the opportunity to draw attention to section 11.2 of the report which refers to the strong relationship with our Dorset MPs. The twice weekly updates have been very well received with MPs and, and been invaluable in working together to support our council in dealing with a number of important issues and challenges as we continue to cope with the day-to-day -day impact of this pandemic. As leader of council, I've also had the opportunity to continue with a strong advocate for Dorset 
There's been a series of virtual meetings via Skype or Microsoft Teams or telephone conferences calls organised by a variety of um, national and regional local government bodies. And I refer to a list of these bodies as set out in report under section 11.3. In conclusion, can I draw attention to what happens following Cabinet today? The recommendation is to note the report and refer the report to the Resources uh, Scrutiny Committee um, for members to consider the response. So I'm now going to hand and uh, to invite the first uh, person who's been indicated to speak, and that's um, the Chief Executive, Matt Prosser. Good morning. Thank you very much indeed, Spencer. Uh, Matt Prosser, Chief Executive of Dorset Council. I'd like to start by giving a brief overview of the report and ostensibly the strategic approach that we agreed early in this process. And then colleagues and members of the Cabinet will talk about the, uh, the work that they've been doing to lead through this, this, this crisis. However, before I start the report, uh, I'd like to give some thanks um, firstly to the residents, communities and businesses of Dorset for how they've handled themselves in our response to this global pandemic, which as we already have just heard has resulted in a tragic loss of 174 members of our community to date. I want to give thanks to our partners, both in the public, private and third sector, including our towns and parish councils. The response has been impressive <coughs> and our volunteers have all been amazing. We're still in the position of having more volunteers than there is actually work on the ground, but I'm grateful to be in that position and to have the support of 1700 residents if needed. At some point you may still be. And finally, I think it'd be appropriate as Spencer has done for me to thank the staff uh, and members of Dorset Council, who on the 16th of March, a week ahead of the formal lockdown, started the move to becoming a virtual organisation of two and a half thousand colleagues having to work from home with a further 2,000 colleagues moving to work with social distancing measures and PPE as required in place. And on top of that, our fantastic schools and their response to support the education of our vulnerable children and children of key workers. This was a huge but necessary effort, and I want to recognise it. Like many businesses locally, we had the ability for some to work from home, but this was like nothing else. So to those colleagues who are working at a kitchen table today whilst homeschooling or caring for someone who's shielding, thank you. For those on the front line continuing to deliver those critical services in challenging circumstances, again, my thanks go to you. We had as a council in February agreed a new council plan with a simple but broad vision to support Dorset as a great place to live, work and visit. Clearly this was not appropriate for Dorset in its response to COVID-19. As you will see from Appendix 1 of the report, we agreed informally with the Cabinet in a virtual meeting, the strategic approach and principles that has guided our work during this time. And this was presented to all members at the first of our weekly webinars. The strategic approach was to work to maintain critical services, sustain, sustain care, support the vulnerable and to support our economy. Many of our services, invisible in normal times, have become very visible. Our refuse and recycling service, safeguarding the vulnerable, providing social care, our schools who've remained open to support our most vulnerable and the children of key workers. Our revenues and benefits team providing support and guidance to individuals, homeowners and businesses. Our housing team supporting those who become homeless or already on the streets for whatever reason. Critical services, sustaining care, supporting the vulnerable and our economy. So the principles that we used to drive those decisions were firstly and most foremost was to seek to support our communities and businesses to respond positively to public health and government messages. We recognised that this was not going to be easy and we needed our, our residents and our businesses to support those key messages. The recycling was being based on keeping our employees safe and well. We're a large employer and a responsible employer, and we need to make sure that our employees are safe and well. And finally, perhaps internally more, support the changing culture that we want for Dorset Council. We're a new org organisation, and we want to ensure we maintain that change in process in a positive way. I'm shortly going to hand over to Aidan Dunn, who's the Executive Director for Corporate Development, who took the role of COVID uh, gold lead and he'll explain that. But as I do, can I just remind viewers and listeners that this report is just a snapshot in time. Clearly some of the information in this will have become out of date just in a week since it was published. And in that context, remind members and the public that decisions were made at the time in light of the best advice and guidance that we had and not with the benefit of hindsight that might be available to some now. It may be a surprise to know that during, during the early days of this crisis, we got our information like everyone else by listening to the daily briefings on the news and then shaping the response to this at pace, all hours of the day and seven days a week. We are still, as the leader has said, in crisis mode. And for some groups, as you will hear, 
This will carry on long after the lockdown finishes for the many of us. Those who are super shielding, for example, those who will carry the physical, mental and emotional burden of having been in lockdown, or for those families and individuals who've lost loved ones to COVID-19. This report sets out Dorset Council's initial response to this global pandemic, but we will also briefly mention recovery and reset. We have a statutory role in that, but we also have a role as a council. And as a council, we will be here to support our young people, our families, our communities and our business economy rebuild over the short, medium and long term. Aidan, can I hand over to you to talk about our initial emergency response? Thank you, Matt, and good morning, colleagues. Uh, I'm Aidan Dunn. I'm the Executive Director of Corporate Development. And for the past seven weeks, I've been the Council's COVID gold lead. Now, let me explain what that means. Um, we know that an effective response to any emergency requires coordination, clear communication and decisive action. And to provide that framework, uh, to enable that to happen at a Dorset level, we have what's called the Local Resilience Forum, the LRF. Now, this is where Dorset's police, fire, ambulance, the council, a BCP council, military, Coast Guard, public health, they all get together to coordinate a response uh, in a group called the Strategic Coordination Group. And this, by necessity, is the command and control structure for Dorset's response to an emergency. So my role as GOLD has been to represent Dorset Council uh, for those critical decision points. Now, as an executive director, in fact, as, as all executive directors within the council, we have had the training and our most recent set of training was prior to Christmas. But it's always one of those things that you hope you never have to use to be trained up to deal with such a response. So I felt that we were in a good position. Now, early on in the COVID crisis, as a senior leadership team, we agreed that it was probably best if I took the role of COVID gold, because in particular, my colleagues who are heading up children's services, adult services and those place based services, we knew were going to be involved in huge operational and logistical issues day to day. So I was freed up to focus on the gold role. So to be effective as an organisation, we need to be able to feed the information up and down the organisation really, really quickly. And so you'll see in this report at Appendix 2 and at Appendix 3 that you get a sense of the complexity of the arrangements we've got in place and the response that we've made. In my gold role, I've been supported uh, throughout by Matthew Piles and Karen Panchard, who have um, really represented the organisation at a silver level the next tier down to ensure that careful coordination. So as GOLD and as the uh, Resilience Forum, we've dealt with issues ranging from personal protective equipment through testing, uh, communications, trying to discourage visitors to Dorset and encouraging the social distancing rules. Let me just give you a little flavour of that. You'll be aware from the national media that uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, has been a huge issue nationally and it has been and continues to be a huge issue locally uh, within Dorset. So one of the issues that we were expecting was a national delivery very early on uh, and a national coordinated response. But unfortunately, this hasn't happened and it remains. Uh, we're still awaiting the Clipper distribution service to be arranged. So that meant with very short notice that Dorset Council and partners across Dorset needs to establish exactly how much PPE they could uh, we needed where we were going to get it from and then arrange the distribution mechanism. And this is where all the partners came together. Dorset Council stepped in to provide a uh, facility uh, to, to where all the, the PPE equipment could be delivered. I mean, essentially, the council set up its own drive through arrangements and we work with public health, with the NHS and with military coordination to ensure that the, the emergency distribution of personal protective equipment could be handled very quickly. Deliveries were received overnight and orders dispatched pretty much the next day and we provide the transportation to that. So a really, really quick and responsive service. So I can say that the level of mutual support and partnership working across Dorset has been phenomenal. We've seen the fire service delivering food parcels. We've seen the military uh, colleagues providing support and operating the testing stations. We've had transport and delivery. Uh, it, overall, it's been a phenomenal response and indeed it continues. 
And this is very much, as Matt has alluded to, that we've started the recovery work as well. We, are, we know that we're in the middle of a, a current crisis, but we're already planning for the journey back to the new normality. So I think we can be rightly proud of the work that's taken place across Dorset and the work that continues. So that's my gold perspective. I'd now like to hand over to Sam Crow, who's our Director of Public Health. Thank you, Aidan, and good morning all. I'm Sam Crow, Director of Public Health for Dorset Council and also for VCP Council. I'm just going to give you a quick overview of some of the public health challenges and I guess to reflect on where I think we are uh, in responding to the pandemic. As the local leader for public health, I work very closely with Public Health England to provide public health yeah. advice to the local system. And as Aidan mentioned, we work very closely with multi-agency partners in the local resilience forum and through the strategic coordinating group. Um, I have to say that this unprecedented change to the way that we normally do business has been unlike anything I've ever experienced in my career. When I began to realise the likely impact of this change, uh, perhaps in February, uh, it was clear that this would be very, very different to how we've worked in previous pandemics. And I've been involved in two in my 20 year career, but none have been anything like this in terms of the scale, the impact, and perhaps the lack of interventions that we have uh, in order to deploy to protect people and keep them safe. But my assessment is that through this local response to the pandemic, uh, through both the work of both councils and the health and care system, the response has been outstanding. Because of the social distancing measures deployed and the fact that largely people have stayed home to protect services and save lives, the impact to date, I don't believe, has been as severe as in other parts of the UK. We've had 328 confirmed cases in Dorset Council. But remember, this is just a fraction of the true number of cases because of the lack of access to testing, particularly in the early weeks of the pandemic. There are likely to be many more infections uh, among untested people in the community, perhaps as many as up to 8,000. And I think that brings me on to uh, my next couple of points, which is just where I think we are heading over the next few weeks and why it's really important for us to maintain our focus and our efforts. The fact that we still have infections circulating in the community is very real news to those of us working in supportive care homes. And unfortunately, that's where the real pressure at the moment is. So across Dorset Council, perhaps as many as one in four care homes uh, either have a current outbreak due to COVID or have had an outbreak investigated over the past few weeks. And that's really where we're starting to really focus our efforts, working with Dorset CCG, colleagues in adult social care, um, and uh, the primary care team locally to provide more support to those care homes and to prevent further transmission. The other focus for the public health team over the next few weeks is going to be starting to think about as we come out of the acute phase and the government starts to look at potentially easing the policy on lockdown, how do we support the national efforts on contact tracing? Um, we're starting to think nationally about the design of that service and you'll have heard in the briefing last night Matt Hancock starting to give details of how the national app is going to work alongside public health teams to support the contact tracing effort. So that's where the public health team is going to be focusing over the next few weeks um, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to obviously lend a huge amount of support to that effort as that's the way out of the current social distancing measures and the way that we can start to look at safely easing the current measures and, and getting back to a new normal. I'll pause there. Um, the report picks up uh, sort of further detail about the extent to which the public health team has been involved in supporting uh, the response to the crisis, but um, I just wanted to, to make those points today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sam. That was very helpful. Can I move on to community support now and ask uh, Theresa Levy to, to speak, please? Good morning, colleagues. Theresa Levy, Executive Director for Children, and I'm chairing the Community Shield work. So if I could just do a brief upset update on how our work with our schools and our children and families in, in the county has been progressing. So our schools have been truly amazing. Uh, we have at, at great pace coordinated together, working around clusters to be able to firstly manage the shutdown of schools um, and then increasingly managing the gentle opening up again for key workers and for vulnerable pupils. And schools have worked incredibly well to make sure that there was capacity 
both over the Easter bank holiday weekend, schools were open on the Good Friday and on the bank holiday Monday, and increasingly to make sure that vulnerable pupils, as are required by the Department of Education, are returning to school day by day. And we can see those figures are, are at a good level at the present time. And clearly we're working with families carefully to make sure that families also have choice where it's appropriate that their children aren't in school, where potentially there's either symptoms in the family or there are concerns around people's well-being and, and, and health within that, that arrangement. So working really carefully with our schools and with lots of colleagues across transport, getting a free school meals offer of, ahead of um, the national scheme, which was which was a bit slow, um, and having and making sure that our children who didn't have access to dinners and, and lunches whilst they were out of school were able to be uh, provided with food too. In the world of safeguarding, um, you'll have all seen there's been significant communications around changes and adaptations to legislation. We're at sort of 98 changes and counting at the present time. A range of those easements are available to us should we need to use them. At the present time, we're not anticipating that. We are seeing um, our demand for services slowly increasing, but it had fallen off significantly in the early days and we were concerned about that, as were our partners across the safeguarding agenda. So we have a weekly safeguarding cell meeting where we're monitoring very carefully the issues around domestic abuse, child abuse, drug and alcohol use, and the issues around community safety and working together to ensure that we're continuing to visit and see our most vulnerable in our society in terms of children and families. The Community Shield work has been um, an exemplary um, experience of, of being able to be privileged to lead the widest partnership of voluntary organisations, partners and ourselves in being able to respond to those 15,000 Dorset residents who are assessed as needing to shield. And that's that's due to a range of health conditions and potentially multiple health conditions and age. For some people on that 15,000 list are very young children who have significant health conditions. Some people are adults, some people are older adults, and some people are clearly families where there are adults who need to shield and the children will also be within that family household. As you all appreciate, shielding means you're not going out for anything. You're not going out for food. You're not going out for medicines, you're not going out for exercise. It really is a, the best description of lockdown. I think what some of us have been experiencing isn't, isn't quite that, but that is what shielded people need to be living with. Lots of people obviously have great resources of their own and they have great family resources or they have great local resources, which means that people can sort them the food and the medicines that they need. Where that hasn't been possible, central government have been delivering some food parcels to people. And, uh, and, in, and in time, getting them access to online food ordering with the supermarkets. That's been clunky. Um, and in the meantime, to make sure that none of our residents went without, as part of our phoning many hundreds and thousands of those residents. In fact, at the present time, we have been in contact with over 6,000 of those residents and have completed e-assessments on their needs, both their food needs, their medicine needs and any care needs they have. We've been able to, with the help of colleagues across the, the county and across the partnership, deliver food and medicines where necessary. That's going to be an ongoing piece and I know Laura and others will talk more about how we're going to respond in the future with this. People who are shielded won't be released, as, as, as Matt suggested earlier, from that position at the point in which lockdown restrictions are removed for, for the most of the population. So how we work with those communities and making sure that we continue to support the fantastic work of the Dorset Volunteer Bureau, Age UK, the Churches Together organisation and a range of help and kindness and other organisations across the county. I don't want to name any more because I'll miss somebody. But we know that we've been coordinating that offer not to get in the way of it. And that's how we want to continue as we go forward. I'll leave it there if I may, Spencer. I think I'm going to hand to Vivian. Look, we're going to we're going to change a slight change of plan. Um, I think Vivian's having an issue with a connection, so we're going to go to uh, Councillor Laura Miller. Thank you, Spencer. Um, I, I just need to start by adding my own thanks and tributes to, to my colleagues. Thanks. The time between the start of this crisis and now um, speaking to this summary of everything that's been done just seems to have gone by in an absolute flash. Our teams have mobilised, uh, innovated and delivered quickly, but also and most importantly compassionately. 
Um, and I would draw your attention especially to the community shield work, which has been quite frankly inspiringly driven by Theresa Levy. I've been the political lead for this work alongside my colleague Andrew Parry. And during our daily meetings with the community shield teams, I, I was astonished at our officers' professionalism under huge pressure um, and their dedication, their humour, their commitment. Uh, I think we were all frequently humbled by the stories that just kept us all going. And when I talk about our teams, uh, I include our partners in the community and voluntary sector, and I use the word partners in its truest sense. The work done during Community Shield by these organisations has been amazing. We have sped into a collaborative way of working with the barriers just simply removed. And it's my determination not to lose that way of working as we get into our new normal, whatever that looks like. And I hope that our community and voluntary organisations know how much we value them as equal partners with different but equally essential skills. I also want to draw your attention to the fact that our COVID response helplines, our proactive calling and our support services have all been eight till eight, seven days a week. And that includes many of our business as usual services, checking on our most vulnerable, um, which have adapted at speed to meet our needs of our residents. And you can see from the report, and I need to thank all our teams um, for just how quickly they adapted. Um, they saw a need and they just adapted to that need. Uh, Aidan touched on our PPE drive through hub. And that's provided huge uh, equipment and reassurance as well for our care homes, but not only our care homes, funeral directors, opticians um, and more, even though we're not normally a supplier of PPE. So I'm really proud. Our teams responded to requests for PPE supplies within an hour and a half and delivered that directly to a care home on a Sunday. And I, I think that's that's great. Uh, we've also been in regular touch with uh, all the CQC registered settings and kept those relationships really strong and the feedback we've had from those settings has been excellent so I'm really pleased about that. We've, as I mentioned earlier in response to, to Nick's question, we've increased care capacity uh, which has enabled greater capacity in our acute hospitals. Um, that is just an innovative example of an integrated health and care system that's been achieved really rapidly and under immense pressure. And, you know, we're not anywhere near normality. And when we get there, it will be a different kind of normal. I am going to take huge lessons away from the work we've done so far. I think this report reflects the way we've significantly changed how we work and also how we show that we value our residents. And I just want to um, beg your indulgence and share two moments um, throughout this process that have had a really profound effect on me. Um, and I think our first virtual cabinet meeting is a good place to share them. The first um, was to hear from our teams that many residents, after they received a call from our team to see how they were coping, a very common request from them was for a further call in a few days time, just, just to see how I'm doing, just to check if I'm still here. Uh, and it struck me that we've often been the only lifeline and support that some people have. The second observation and experience really was um, during a phone call to provide support. One of our residents misheard our team member and they referred to her as vulnerable, uh, but she heard valuable. And from then we've all started to refer to our most valuable residents. Um, let's keep that. This crisis has starkly highlighted that our most valuable asset is each other. Uh, we've got a long climb ahead of us yet. Yeah, we're not out of the crisis period, uh, but I commend this report and I welcome scrutiny of it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Lord, and I, I share your sentiments to what you've just said. Can I move on to um, Andrew Parry, please? Thank you, Chairman. Um, today's report, uh, particularly in the sections 14.1 through to 14.13, and the impact on the operational service of children and schools, uh, reports of this nature um, really do lay bare the challenges and the reality of the situation we find ourselves in. But what it can never do is articulate our heartfelt thanks to the schools and the childcare settings uh, for all the work they are doing, the leadership, the teachers, the staff, the extraordinary levels that we have seen and heard about, uh, not only in providing a curriculum for our children across the county, but also the huge efforts that they've gone to to maintain pastoral care uh, and to ensure that safeguarding remains in place for all pupils. Uh, and we really are extraordinarily grateful to them for that. I also wanted to uh, take the opportunity to praise parents and, and foster carers, many of whom I know are juggling uh, a, a range of issues. You know, they've got the financial worries, they may be working from home uh, in less than ideal surroundings. 
Um, and yet they have to support their children who are either still attending uh, uh, school bases or are, are actually homeschooled. Now, I do know that one of the challenges this has presented is the fact that they are finding themselves having to share the width of the broadband. And that's making it very difficult to sometimes in order to maintain those IT links. Um, now, I know in particular that this is something that Councillor Wolf and Councillor Suttle are talking to BT about with the support of our members of Parliament. And I understand the West Orst MP Chris Loder is actually meeting the Minister about this today to put further pressure on BT to carry on the rollout of superfast broadband, which is so essential for the connectivity of our county. I did want to also um, take the opportunity to give my personal thanks to all our officers and children's services, and in particular our frontline social workers, um, who continue to do everything they possibly can to support our most valuable children and families, because that is how we see them. But at a time it was, must feel like impossible odds. And I know that they do this with great fortitude and do amazing things to ensure that our, our, our children in care and our care leavers and our children who are on protection plans remain safe. So I'm hugely grateful to them all, Chairman. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Andrew. Can I now hand over to Graham Carr Jones? Do we have Graham? It would appear we might not. Which way, we'll carry on and we'll come back to him if he comes back online. Can we go on to? Um, John Selgren and, and, the, and the focus on place and so forth. Chairman. John? Hello. Are you there, Graham? I am, Chairman. I'm oh, just, you weren't there just now. Right. So, an issue with reaching the mute button on the keyboard. But anyway, Chairman, the first thing that I'd like to do is not only to commend the officers uh, for this COVID-19 report. It's a comprehensive, informative, it's a fundamental piece of work, phenomenal. Um, but I want to recognise that it's also an, an, a historical document that will chat the, for future generations this pandemic and the efforts made by this council for the good, for the good of Dorset and our communities. Uh, if I'm going to turn to my particular portfolio in housing and community safety, pages 29 and 30 of the amended report provide a few paragraphs regarding the work that has been taking place in the housing and community safety service. But Chairman, this does not do justice to the huge amount of work that has been taking place in response to this crisis. I need to extend my thanks on behalf of Cabinet to everyone in the housing service who has been working tirelessly to meet this increased demand. The housing teams were given less than four days notice to provide accommodation for the rough sleeping community. A huge piece of work took place to find providers of accommodation and then work with the rough sleeping community to get them settled and provide them with the necessary support. In the report, it details that a total of 28 rough sleepers agreed to be accommodated, and, but a further eight declined that offer, but we are supporting them with outreach workers. I think it would be fair to say that there have been some real challenges along the way regarding some of the behaviours of those accommodated. But the council is working hard with partners such as the police, probation services and the drug and alcohol team to deal with issues as they arise. Over five of the group have now been reconnected with their own local areas and are being supported by housing teams there. Again, some of this work was, well, shall I say interesting. But there have been some really positive stories as well from a few of those accommodated who see this as an opportunity to make some real changes in their lives and have realised that they don't need to live on the streets and there is an alternative with a future. The council has also seen an unprecedented demand on their homelessness services. Since the report was written, the numbers have changed with a further 25 persons provided with accommodation, taking the total to over 85 people since the introduction of the lockdown measures. There have been many reasons why the council is seeing an increase in demand. Although the government put laws in place to prevent eviction during COVID-19 pandemic, some people were living in shared accommodation without a tenancy agreement and paying their rent in cash, and they were told to leave as they could not pay their rent. Others were sofa surfing or living in spare rooms 
and asked to leave by someone who needed to shield themselves. In other cases, it could simply be due to a relationship breakdown that between the parents with older, older children at home or between couples. Chairman, as the housing market is effectively closed to new renters, people are unable to find, find accommodation and they are relying solely on the council for support. The increased numbers of cases has led to increased workload on an already busy housing team and work is pl taking place to move work around internally to provide support where it is needed. There is a concern that once restri restrictions are lifted, there will be another spike and those presenting at homeless as homeless as people find that they cannot pay their rent. The housing service has set up a group with partners, including shelter, CAB, housing standards and trading standards to look at what advice and support can be offered to those who are concerned about rent arrears and they're also focusing on messages about not to approach loan sharks to borrow money. If I turn to domestic abuse, Chairman, you will have seen reports in the national press that there are concerns about an increase in calls to helplines offering support. The National Domestic Abuse Helpline provides advice and information and signposts people to local service providers for the support if needed. But it would appear that whilst there is an increase in calls to the National Helpline, Dorset Council's Commissioned Domestic Abuse Service Provider has not seen an increase in the number of referrals from the National Domestic Abuse Helpline. But what they have done is they've noticed more calls relating to lower level family tensions and arguments. The police have also reported an increase in incidents relating to family tensions and disputes, which officers are investigating in a bit more detail. In response, the community safety team is working with colleagues in adults and safeguarding and communications to put out messages about how to maintain healthy relationships and where to go to get some support. Our providers of refuges in Dorset continue to assure us that they have some capacity to take referrals should someone be fleeing domestic abuse and they need to self-isolate or be part of the upper shield, super shielded group that refuges can provide the necessary support. Finally, Chairman, you will recall that on the 2nd of March, we launched a consultation for the new housing allocations policy and the closing date was the 25th of May. So far, we have had an excellent response to the consultation with only over 600 responses. However, I'm aware that the, clo the, the consultation closure of libraries, uh, not everyone will have had access to the internet. So we've mm. decided to extend that consultation for a further six weeks after the original closing date. Chairman, I think that's fine for me. Thank you. Th thank, thank you very you much, much, Graham. Right. Very Sorry, appre I appreciate the, uh, the, you know, the clarity around the stuff you've discussed. Can I move on to um, John Selgren now and talk about some of the place issues, John? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'll say a few words about place uh, perhaps at the end. You've mentioned in the introductory comments about the recovery process and I have the officer lead uh, on recovery. So just a very quick overview of that, which is referenced uh, in the report. Aidan referred in his comments to the work of the Local Resilience Forum and specifically to the Strategic Coordination Group, which coordinates on an interagency basis the response uh, to this and other civil contingencies challenges. That process is paralleled in recovery by a recovery coordinating group, which itself operates within the framework of national guidance. And helpfully, that national guidance gives a very clear definition of the recovery phase of the work. It describes recovery as an enabling and supportive process, which allows individuals, families and communities to attain their proper level of functioning through, through the provision of information, specialist services and resources. Recovery is a process in that guidance, which is a local government lead, and therefore Dorset Council has been working very closely with BCP Council and with our multi-agency partners in health, police, fire, voluntary sector and others to ensure that we have a joined up pan Dorset response in the recovery phase. In addition to that, Dorset Council will of course need to plan for the post recovery of its own organisation. And comment was made earlier about perhaps two stages to that. Reference was made to a reset process. So for me, reset is about adjusting to the current circumstances that we will need to consider on an ongoing basis. 
For example, the need to have social distancing over a prolonged period of time, not only for the delivery of our services, but also in relation to our support services and office based activities. There's also the more formal recovery stage, which will actually allow Dorset Council as an organisation to attain its own proper level of functioning, which again, Chairman, as you've said earlier, would include the uh, return to the more conventional arrangements for the conduct of member meetings. I'm pleased to report that work has already commenced on all of these plans, both at LRF level and Dorset Council level. And again, this is something which I hope that officers and members will be able to report upon as we go forward, because government makes very clear in that guidance that whilst an incident is going on, and we know that this one will for some con considerable period of time, it is important that individual organisations and working on a collaborative basis do prepare and mobilise recovery plans in parallel with the ongoing response. Can I turn now, Chairman, to the work of the Directorate during the response phase of the COVID-19 epidemic? The, the uh, Place Directorate has been playing an active role in many ways, as has been described earlier in the, in the presentations. We, of course, have a number of key essential frontline services of our own, and our priority has been to make sure that these continue to serve our public in this very challenging time. The second role, and again, colleagues in people have made extensive reference to this, the Directorate has been very pleased to support colleagues across the organisation with some pr practical support in areas like logistics, particularly in transport, and also the making available of premises for particular and specialist purposes. I'm now going to hand over to Councillor Ray Bryan, who's going to update on his portfolio area. Thank you, John. Um, one word sums up everything I'm hearing, and that's teamwork. The team have come together so well from all departments. I think we should be very, very proud of what we've achieved. Highways, for instance, have been helping distribute food and PPE. They have also been carrying out uh, emergency roadworks where necessary. This week, highways have restarted work on a number of projects that had been suspended. We are trying to do these roadworks whilst the traffic flow is probably at its lowest we will experience. That's essential going forward. In the Dorset Travel Team, they've been reorganising transport for those children who have uh, continued to go to school so their parents could continue with their key worker jobs. We are now having to plan for the future. It's expected that announcement will be made at some stage that will enable people to have more flexibility in their activities. I do hope people will remember that they still have the responsibility to act in a responsible manner. We have been converting our small fleet of buses I'll be installing Perspex screens to make sure that when they come into use and they are being used at the moment, um, then they are protecting uh, the staff from from anything that could uh, um, happen. Harbours has been an issue that I've already mentioned once this morning, and that's that uh, a lot of the harbour users feel quite aggrieved that they're still having to pay for their berthing fees, etc. It's a fact that unfortunately life is going on. The uh, uh, the boats are still being stored there, so there's not a lot we can do about it. The environment is essential as we go forward. We have continued with as much work as we can during these very difficult times. Utilization of staff has been absolutely essential with many of the people that are involved in green space doing other jobs and they're still looking at doing other jobs going forward. Vehicle movements in Dorset are down by approximately 70% with peaks at weekends. We are seeing a variance of about 4% during the week. The message still has to be to stay at home and I do hope people will take that on board. There's a number of other issues that I would mention we have vacated the old radio station so that that can be used for other purposes. And we've moved the fleet and drivers to County Hall. We've been keeping in touch with community transport operators and volunteer centres. 
uh, Volunteer Centre Dorset as community volunteer programmes are set up to deliver vital surprise, supplies and medicines to the vulnerable residents. I'm now going to pass on to, I think it's David. It is. Yeah, David, David Walsh. Thank you, Ray. So I'm Councillor David Walsh, portfolio holder for planning. So what has been the impact of COVID-19 on planning? Building control officers have continued to undertake essential site inspection work where construction has continued. There have been several incidents involving dangerous structures and our officers have worked with colleagues from Dorset and Wiltshire Fire and Rescue Service to make safe. They have my thanks. In line with government advice, we are taking a pragmatic approach to enforcement in the knowledge that some businesses are having to adapt very suddenly to tough economic circumstances. In general, we will therefore prioritise taking formal enforcement action if there is a genuine and immediate health threat or safety threat. The major change to planning is that nearly all officers and support staff are working from home in line with the government's instructions. I would ask for a degree of patience and understanding if struggling to get hold of particular individuals. Resourcing staffing levels have seen some impact from caring responsibilities for vulnerable family members and young children, as well as some staff contracting COVID-19 or self-isolating. However, sickness levels have been relatively low to date. This may affect how much time they can spend working and some are having to work different hours to fit in with their responsibilities. I was asked, can we put a hold on all planning applications until this is over? The simple answer is no, because the government is keen that we continue to deliver a planning service. And so are we at Dorset Council in the interest of managing the impact of COVID-19 on the economy. Where there are practical difficulties, such as being able to visit sites, we are making good use of technology, such as Google Earth, asking applicants to email photographs or put up site notices themselves where they're able to do so safely. And holding Skype meetings. This is a practical solution to help us continue working on applications, including trees and listed buildings. But in some cases, we will have to delay decisions. For example, situations where there is a statutory requirement to put up a site notice and it is not possible to do so. Or where the complexity of the site or application requires a detailed or site assessment that can be, not be carried out at this time. Sorry, this means that some decisions may need Hello, Councillor Walsh, it's Kate Critchell. Unfortunately, your mute is on. Could you? I'm sorry, when did my mute go on? Oh, just a few seconds ago. <clears throat> sorry. Um, <clears throat> I was asked if all um, decisions will be made by delegated powers. I can categorically say the answer to that is no. As was agreed by all members when adopting the Dorset Council Constitution, all applications which activate the trigger points for it to go before an area planning committee, it will still do so. If there are genuine reasons based on material planning considerations for an application to go before committee, it will. And I have been working with area planning committees with their chairs and vice chairs to prepare for going live with virtual meetings very soon. <coughs> we are continuing work on the Dorset local plan, the timeline for which was agreed by all members to enable adoption by April 2023. Though there are immediate impacts of COVID-19 that have put a halt to some work within their service, including local plan site assessments, work requiring site visits, this should not hold up the overall time frame for production of the new Dorset local plan, unless there is a prolonged period of restriction. I would like to say that the local plan executive advisory panel, which is continuing, made up from members across all parties We'll continue working virtually with officers to ensure that the plan stays on track to meet the timeline. We have been working on a vision and strategic priorities paper, paper which will form part of the public consultation, all being well before the end of the year. 
The paper will now be used to help establish which strategic priorities are needed within the local plan and what the emphasis should be behind these. So under the heading of Dorset will be a great place to live, work and visit in time, we are emphasising the need to address the climate and ecological emergency, economic growth, our unique environment, suitable housing, strong healthy communities and staying safe and well. A great deal of work and time has been put into neighbourhood planning in many of our communities, as with the three coming up later in this cabinet agenda. I am increasingly pleased to see that such dedication has been recognised and planning guidance changed. Because regulations linked to the Coronavirus Act 2020 mean that no elections or referendums can take place until the 6th of May 2021. This includes neighbourhood plan referendums. And so current planning guidance has been updated to set out that neighbourhood plans awaiting referendums can be given significant weight in decision making. I would like to say thank you to everyone that's keeping the planning system going as government requires. I've even got a story where <coughs> one of our planning officers has become somewhat of a hero of mine. He's working from home, his wife is a nurse, and he's looking after the children and juggling the work that he's doing to keep the, the local plan going. So my thanks to him and to everyone else out there that is keeping a planning system going for Dorset Council, because this is vital for the economy. So thank you, Chairman. I'll hand over to Anthony Alford. And thank you very much. I will uh, talk about some of the services within my area, but first of all, I'd like to um, express some words of thanks and thanks in particular to uh, the voluntary and community sector organisations. They have been thanked already, but I do want to add my thanks as well and certainly express my appreciation for all the hard work and contribution that they have been uh, you know, giving uh, through this emergency. Also, I would like to thank the uh, council officers who have the liaison with those groups and have enabled them to be so successful. So thank you to all of you concerned. I must mention the town and parish councils because they do an immense amount of work in their local communities and another group of people, organisations that have made a valuable contribution during this emergency. During this time, of course, our communications team has been supplying town and parish councils with information and uh, the latest news and advice. And I think that has been well received. So I'd like to thank our communications team for that work that they have done. Uh, I turn now to various services and the impact that the emergency has had. We now have a streamlined service for the registration of deaths. Um, that is all done now on a telephone um, uh, system, uh, telephone call, and that is supported by the electronic transmission of documents. We have been able to increase the number of services that they are uh, held at the Weymouth Crematorium, and uh, we allow friends and family uh, of the deceased to attend, up to 10, observing social distancing, of course. Um, you'll be aware of various regulations that have been issued under the uh, coronavirus emergency, um, in particular about places of business that can be open and also social distancing within the workplace. These regulations are uh, the concern and interest of our trading standards officers and our environmental health officers and they have been working together to give guidance uh, to um, businesses about how they can implement the uh, new regulations properly and in a, with a satisfactory outcome. So there's a lot of guidance and information has been given. Um, Dorset as a whole has been very compliant in this respect and there has not been any need to issue fixed penalty notices or any other prosecutions. So that has been working very, very well. Um, if I turn next to waste, um, our waste collection service has been maintaining a high standard of performance 
uh, we did have an initial impact with the um, a number of people who were away on isolation. We have had a number of members of staff who have joined from other services and uh, they've had the training in dr uh, driving or loading and um, they are now contributing towards the service and that is being maintained at a very high level. And I do know that the public very much appreciate uh, that service continuing. Um, we have, of course, restored the garden waste collection service recently, and that has been well received. And one area we are working on at the moment is the um, possibility of opening the household recycling centres as quickly as we can. There is a, an issue about the uh, regulations that um, I referred to before, which set out those permitted journeys that people can make, leave home to make, um, and whether going to the household recycling centre is one of those. So we are doing some work on that uh, to see we are lobbying for a change in uh, that legislation, in fact, and um, we will see that if we can open household recycling centres as quickly as we can. Um, I do want to mention next our customer services activity. Um, that has been supplemented by a, a number of library staff following their um, the closure of the libraries um, in March. Um, many of those staff are supplementing the customer services uh, team. Um, as you all know, of course, the um, helpline is open seven days a week from eight till eight and is dealing with a large number of inquiries from the public not only corona, help with coronavirus emergency, but also business as usual um, requests as well. So that has been a real um, benefit to the council during this time. Um, it's useful to say as well that um, this particular place service for customer, uh, customer services has also been assisting people services as well, uh, certainly in relation to some proactive calls um, that are um, useful to make. So the, those people services have been assisted um, through those telephone calls. And while the libraries are closed, of course, it is still possible to borrow electronic um, documents or publications. And it is interesting to note that the membership of libraries has been increasing over this time uh, by, uh, with applications from people who want to take advantage of these things. And there are various other um, electronic services that the libraries uh, people are providing during this time. And then finally, I will just mention uh, an initiative that's being worked on by the Dorset History Centre. Um, and it's under the theme uh, Coronavirus Diaries. And this gives the opportunity, there are about 100 people at the moment who are engaged with this, who are writing up diaries. They may be on paper, um, but using all sorts of media to describe the experience of living through this emergency. And hopefully that will be a very valuable um, community asset uh, in times in the future when people want to say, what was it like during that time? You know, we'll have that record. So that um, broadly, uh, that well, completes my report and um, I will pass over. I think Jonathan Mayer may be next. Thank before you. I get there, Tony, before I invite Jonathan, I want, I'm conscious of the fact that Gary Suttle isn't here and he would be saying something about uh, uh, business support at this point and it's just worth reflecting on the fact that uh, the latest data I've got is that we've now processed 6,312 um, uh, valid uh, applications for grant support which is 77 percent of that being uh, that's been submitted and it's a value of around 75 million so we are moving in the right direction we're doing what we said we do and i think gary's ambition along with um revs and ben's that we'll get it all done within a relatively short time from now on but i'm now going to go over to uh, jonathan mayor who's going to talk about gold emergency planning and mortuary management jonathan good morning members thank you uh, jonathan mayor corporate director legal and democratic one of the service areas uh, that I'm responsible for is emergency planning. 
Uh, and I've been incredibly proud of the emergency planning team uh, and the work that that team has led to coordinate all of the efforts of the council uh, in responding to COVID-19. So a particular thank you um, to the emergency planning team. What I'm going to concentrate upon uh, this morning, though, is the um, very sombre subject of excess death planning. We know that every day in our communities and in our hospitals in ordinary times, uh, people die. Uh, but excess death planning is about planning for that worst case situation uh, when we face very significant numbers of deaths in communities uh, and, and in hospitals. When I was thinking about what I was going to say this morning, I did wonder if I should shy away uh, from talking about excess death planning. It is a difficult subject, uh, but I decided that it was really important um, that people should hear about what we're doing um, so that they can be confident um, that if we were in, a, in, a, um, in that situation, um, that both the deceased uh, and um, the bereaved would be treated uh, with, pro with proper respect and that we've got proper arrangements um, in place. Uh, so early, earlier on this morning, Aidan Dunn spoke about the work of the Local Resilience Forum and the planning that takes place on a whole Dorset basis, including the area of uh, BCP Council. And that's exactly how we've been working on excess death planning, uh, working across the areas of both uh, councils. And with a colleague from BCP Council, I've been chairing uh, the excess deaths uh, planning group. Uh, and that group um, includes uh, Her Majesty's Chief Coroner for Dorset, representatives of the police, uh, the registration services, bereavement services, uh, the faith communities, and a representative of funeral directors. And as part of the work that we've been doing, uh, we've established two specialist facilities, uh, one at the old radio station site outside of Dorchester, another at the port of Poole. And together, uh, those facilities, if we ever needed um, to make use of them to that extent, would give us the capacity um, to store in excess of um, 1,000 deceased persons in refrigerated conditions. Uh, and I'll pause there because that is uh, a very frightening figure. Um, but it is something that we've had to plan for. So establishing those units, though, is only a part of the work um, that we've been doing and just as important as establishing um, facilities uh, to cope with the worst case situation has been the work that we've done with the coroner, with the police, uh, with bereavement services and registration um, to put in place the right procedures, the right guidance um, to manage deaths in the COVID deaths in the community and COVID deaths um, in, in hospitals. And I think we can be confident that we have those procedures in place um, if, we need to, if we need to follow them to any significant extent. Um, just to finish, um, can I register particular thanks, please, um, to Dorset and Wiltshire Fire and Rescue Service? Uh, we were in a difficult position of having to staff um, these specialist facilities uh, at Poolport and the old radio station site. Um, and it could have been uh, very difficult to do that. Uh, but our partners in Fire and Rescue um, came forward and they've taken that on. Um, they've taken on this very sensitive role and I'm hugely grateful to them uh, for doing that. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to Councillor Graham Carr-Jones. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, uh, Graham Carr-Jones, Housing Portfolio Holder and Community Safety and latterly uh, Emergency Planning. Uh, very, very sobering thoughts there, Jonathan, and, and my thanks like yours go to everybody involved. But to set the scene, Dorset Council is what is known as a Category 1 responder for Dorset under the Civil Contingencies Act. Together with the Blue Light Emergency Services, Health, Coast Guard and the Environment Agency. 
These agencies come together as the Dorset Local Resilience Forum to collaboratively plan for and respond to all civil emergencies. The focus of the Local Resilience Forum is prioritised by the National Risk Register and localised Dorset is equivalent. Pandemic flu has for some time been identified as a high risk. When Dorset Council came into being on the 1st of April in 2019, there was a requirement in the structural change order for a sound emergency planning response from day one. The Shadow Dorset Council approved an emergency response plan which set out a command and control structure for response. The strategic gold officer role is undertaken by executive and corporate directors. The tactical silver officer role is carried out by heads of service, with both roles providing 24-7 cover on a rotor basis. They are supported by a team of emergency planners who work with the legal and democratic assurance service and are the first point of contact 24 hours a day, seven days a week for out of hours response. The Council's emergency planning arrangements were actually in quite a good position leading up to the COVID crisis. As a significant amount of work was undertaken on a business continuity programme during the EU exit preparations. Gold and silver officers were trained and a wide range of services participated in pandemic flu exercises in the latter part of 2019. As the COVID outbreak began to take hold globally, an incident management team was established with cross director representation to both key, relay key information to services and to understand service level issues and pressures. It was recognised that the level of both strategic and tactical focus required for COVID planning and response was of a level that dedicated gold and silver officers were necessary to run alongside the normal command and control structure. This report being presented to Cabinet today sets out the details of the Local Resilience Forum's battle rhythm. At Appendix 2 and, and the Council has been an active partner throughout, from the Gold and Silver Officers, the Emergency Planning Team and the various other officers participating and leading on numerous focused working groups. This contributes to the wider multi-agency strategy to provide a coordinated response that mitigate the potential impacts of this coronavirus, saving and protecting lives and returning us back to a state of normality as soon as possible. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Graham. Um, can I move on to Aidan Dunn who's going to talk a little bit about corporate services response. Aidan? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, Aidan Dunn, Executive Director of Corporate Development. I just wanted to say a, a few words um, uh, about our workforce in particular. So the pandemic nationally or globally has impacted on organisations and businesses in, in many different ways. And across the country, we hear about people who have been furloughed or indeed made redundant and are sat frustrated at home waiting to go back to work. Uh, and you can contrast that with other organisations and in particular public sector workers who are working harder than ever before. It's been no, no different here in Dorset Council and we've heard through this morning about uh, staff that are working throughout the week and through evenings, through bank holidays uh, and uh, constantly. So what we've heard is about staff uh, working flexibly. We've heard about staff developing new services and supporting those key Dorset services that we need, needed to keep operating. Now, one of the things that we've done as an organisation was very early on, having identified those key services that we needed to keep going, we also set up an internal skills agency. So this skills agency was a, a register of 500 colleagues who could be rapidly redeployed to support those key services if staff starts to get sick and not be available. So the intention was always to keep those services operating to support the new priorities of the organisation. And what, what that's meant, for example, is as we've uh, closed our library services, those staff uh, have been quickly redeployed to work on the SHIELD programme that we heard from Teresa earlier. 
And similarly, uh, within corporate services, uh, staff who work in finance and audit have been redeployed into the revenues and benefits team to talk uh, to pay those grants to local businesses that we heard uh, chairman talk about shortly. And that enabled us to accelerate our payment of grants and now we're one of the highest rate of payers in the country. Thinking about workforce overall, we've had a close, uh, we've kept a close monitor on staff sickness and what we did see in the early days of the pandemic was an initial increase in staff sickness with a number of staff uh, reporting COVID-like symptoms. But I'm pleased to say that actually that has declined now and the sickness levels across the organisation are generally below what on average would normally be reporting at this time of year. As a responsible employer, we're really conscious that uh, the impact that COVID is having on our workforce in terms of their health and well-being, as uh, many are working from home, many are in self-isolation and, and working in stressful situations. So we have provided, uh, we set up a, a support package for staff so they can access uh, the care and support they need uh, to in order to keep them safe and well. So we've heard throughout the session about those key services. We've heard how the council has responded and I've just described the impact on our workforce. Uh, and it's been a tremendous response by the council, but it has come at a significant financial cost. So I'm now going to hand over to councillor Tony Ferrari, who's going to talk us through the financial implications as we see them at this point. Tony. Are you there, Tony? Yes. Ah, oh, well done. Um, Tony Ferrari, finance portfolio holder for finance, commercial and assets. Um, Dorset's financial position has been well trailed. Uh, our incomes have dropped sharply from areas like parking, planning applications and others. Our expenditure has risen sharply with uh, social care, PPE, uh, the Rembrandt Hotel, a number of other cost areas. Our estimated figure is for an overspend of £53.6 million over the period of the pandemic. Central government's response has been um, brisk and helpful to date. Um, their first tranche of money was received very early. The second tranche of money has been um, recently defined. Since writing the report, we've worked out that we will be getting 10.4 million from the second tranche, which was about what we got in the first. So we are currently receiving money from central government uh, at a rate that's appropriate for the rate we're spending it. The implication of this is that we need another tranche of money from central government of about the same size, probably within May. Um, but so far, the central government's response has been appropriate in all these circumstances, and we look forward to that continuing. Um, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Tony. Um, we're going to move on now to, in fact, it's the last segment of this uh, part of the report. Councillor Peter Wharf. Peter. Thank you, Spencer. Um, Councillor Peter Wharf, Deputy Leader, <coughs> Portfolio Holder for HR change transformation, but for this particular item, diversity and inclusion. Uh, under the Equality Act 2010, public bodies such as ours must adhere to the public sector equality duty and have due regard to the need to eliminate discrimination, advance equality of opportunity and foster good relations. This means that we need to give full consideration to the impact our decisions have on different groups of people to avoid both risks in terms of litigation and reputation. But also, and actually much more importantly, we need to make sure that we continue to provide services that are effective and efficient and that do not in any sense, whether un unintentionally discriminate against any individual or groups of people. Equality impact assessments are one method which help us to make informed decisions and this is so for this response to COVID-19, so it's no different. As the Equality and Human Rights Commission recently stated in its public letter to the Prime Minister, COVID-19 does not discriminate. It does impact on people differently though. 
the the aim of our EQIA is to understand some of those impacts and if there are some groups in Dorset who may be facing a disproportionate impact and how we're responding to that. What we've done so far is we held a, a group meeting of a cross section of members plus the portfolio holders from adults and children where we discussed the forthcoming equality impact assessment, the requirements for it, and we went round and got some different views. Now, it won't surprise you, but we, we came up with two quite interesting, I think, uh, thoughts. The first was that this is not something that we can produce an EQIA and then leave it on the shelf because the pandemic is likely to come in stages. It's likely to have different effects as we go through. And therefore, when we produce the EQIA, we will need to review it at regular intervals to ensure that it is current and that we change it to reflect the circumstances. And I think Matt Prosser, the chief executive, referred to right at the beginning. This is a constantly changing landscape. The second thing is that what we've identified is that it is likely to have different effects according to different areas of our particular um, region in terms of wards for members or areas in terms of regions. And what we need to do is we need to ensure that we take in, that into account when producing our EQA. So we are going to move forward on this and we're going to start to engage with members through a virtual set of roundtable discussions about the COVID-19 response and what it means in their wards and any concerns they have about any vulnerable groups. This will then be followed up with a virtual roundtable discussion with key organisations from the community, voluntary and faith sector. The, the um, the issue of equality impact assessments would not normally come to cabinet but it is my intention to bring it to a future cabinet because i want the public to be completely aware of it but we are going to start these roundtable sessions with members and we're going to start them very soon and i look to give progress reports on the eqi at regular intervals and certainly give a very detailed progress report at the end of next month the cabinet meeting at the end of june uh, Chairman, that's the end of my statement on the EQIA, but I would ask you, Chairman, if you could pass over to Susan Ward-Rice, who is the equality, Diversity and Equality Officer for Dorset Council, who I think will summarise and give the views from an officer perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Very, very comprehensive. Susan, would you like to add something to what Peter said? Hello, thank you. Um, just following on from Councillor Wharf's comments, um, this EQIA is being led by colleagues from Public Health and myself, um, working with colleagues across the council. Um, we're focusing on the protected characteristics within the Equality Act, plus some additional characteristics that we know impact on people's ability to access services or participate in public life in Dorset. Um, from the work that we've undertaken so far, we're also aware that there are some new emerging groups um, of vulnerable people, such as those that have been recently bereaved, those without digital access or the skills to digitally access services, and those who've normally not engaged with services such as ourselves, but because they've re been recently furloughed or are struggling with their mental well-being, are starting to access some of the services that's both within our, our council but also within the community voluntary and faith sector um, and just sort of similar to um, Councillor Wharf's finishing remarks really that this EQIA focuses on the current situation so lockdown um, the crisis mode but however as the situation changes and develops there is the need to review and update and keep members informed thank you Thank, thank you very much, uh, Peter and Susan. They clearly need to stay agile on, on a matter so important as this. Um, well, the presentation of the report is now complete, but I'm aware that um, we've got the four um, scrutiny chair chairman with us this morning. Um, I'm going to go through them as, as per my, my order list here, and I'm going to ask um, Piers Brown whether he wants to make any comment or ask any questions. Uh, uh, no, not at this time, thank you, Chair. But um, what I would like to do is is encourage um, your colleagues to support the recommendation so that um, the resources overview and scrutiny committee can get their teeth into this. Um, and I also want to take this opportunity to lay out how um, 
I envisage scrutiny being involved going forward. So we'd like to take this opportunity um, in the next few weeks to look into the report that you have in front of you today, but also to take a lot more active role as I'm sure there's going to be a slightly more methodical approach to how we recover and, res um, and reset over the coming months so that scrutiny is involved with that as well. So I foresee there being a greater input from scrutiny going forward, but um, I'm sure we'll get to meet again when this paper comes to scrutiny in the coming weeks. Thank you very much, Piers, and I totally agree with the sentiment you've expressed. Scrut the scrutiny has a significant role to play in how we develop our reset and our recovery uh, strategy. Jill Haynes. I'll mute myself. Hello, Thank Jill. Hello, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jill Haynes, I chair the uh, Health Scrutiny Committee. I've got a couple of comments to make. Um, my first one um, refers to page 60 of the report when we talk about the things that uh, we're proud of. Um, and of course, we are very proud of, I think, the response that uh, Dorset Council has given. But it doesn't mention anywhere there um, our working with um, both our communities, voluntary sector, and in particular the NHS. Uh, we are part of an integrated care system, one of only a few in the country. And um, I think that this, being part of that integrated system, has really assisted the Council's response to COVID and the response across Dorset. So that's my first comment. I think the second thing that isn't mentioned in the report particularly is the fact that we are now one council. And I know that a lot of other councils that are two tiers have found it a lot more difficult to coordinate their response across their areas. So I think it's been very good and timely that we have actually got ourselves to be one council across the area. Um, and the third thing I've got to comment on is that we have um, a large amount of compliments within the report all written out. Um, and it does mention the fact there have been some complaints, but I would have been interested to know at least the themes for those complaints. Suppose that may well have been something we'd need to look at in scrutiny. Health scrutiny will be looking at areas of the COVID response, but that will probably be coming as a joint scrutiny with BCP because it is a whole health system area. And I think that's all I've got to say this afternoon or this morning still. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jill. I'm going to ask uh, Laura Miller if she'd like to respond to the first point and I'll come back on the other two. Laura? Yeah, thank, <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Um, the first, sorry, can you just, Jill, can you just recover your first point, please? Because I was listening to your second. Sorry, Laura. <laughs> that's all right. The thing was the fact that we're an integrated care yeah. system. OK, has, yeah us at the front of the activity. Um, yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I think we should explore that a bit more when we come to actually scrutinise the report um, and we can we can go into that in some kind of verbal detail. But I think your point is absolutely right because um, there are a lot of challenges that would have been even more challenging without being part of an integrated um, health system and care system. And I touched on that a bit earlier, uh, but I absolutely take your point and thank you. Thanks for that, Laura. On the second point about going unitary, Jill, I had the opportunity to speak to um, upper tier councillors, uh, leaders all over the country, and those that are unitary are in a much better place than those that are two tier. I'm not saying that the two tier aren't getting there, they are, but it, I think we've been in a far stronger place, both in terms of how we've responded to the emergency and the resilience that's gone with it. So a lot of praise to, once again, from I take the opportunity to praise everybody that's been involved in that. And the other point about complaints is a good one. And I think it's a point to be taken on board and that when we get to scrutiny, um, that process will we'll sift them out so they can put on the table at the same time and put them next to all the compliments that have been mentioned already. Okay, is that okay with you, Jill? Yes, that's great. Thank you very much, Spencer. As okay. I said, we, we will be looking to uh, various areas for scrutiny uh, from health scrutiny point of view, but really that will be looking <coughs> back at the response rather than um, forward. And we need to be a little further through the system 
um, before we realise how we will take that scrutiny forward. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, next uh, person on the list is Daryl Turner. Morning, Daryl. Chairman, good morning. Thank you. Um, I really just got two small points uh, amongst the, the excellent work that Dorset Council has achieved to date. Um, one is um, reference 11.5 on communications. I just wonder if the Cabinet think it's time for us to send out another hard copy flyer to residents, again, particularly to reach the those people not online. Um, and I also wonder if that single number contact could be put on things like buses around our area as well. Um, do you want me to go on to the second one straight away? Pick up on the first point, Daryl, and you make a very good point about that. I'm aware that comms are doing some work around getting some hard copy out. Some of it you oh. could, there is an opportunity to email. I, mean, I haven't got the exact numbers, but it's sort of at about a third of the people that are identified as being in the vulnerable category can be can be uh, contacted by email or shielded, I should say, and the others will, will get a hard copy in the post. So I think we're, we're, we're working on that. Um, I'll take away the point you've mentioned about um, displaying numbers and things on, on buses and so on, and I'll see, I'll have a conversation with comms uh, away from this meeting. Is that okay? And we'll go on to the, the, the next point. Yep, that is excellent. Thank you very much. Um, the second one is on 16.5, role of councillors in climate change. Um, and I think, I'm asking the cabinet basically to agree that um, it's essential that we don't go back to doing things how we used to do them. Um, with the reset and recovery section, I think we've already changed the way we operate and the, and the simplest start to that would be to reduce the unnecessary travel and use the remote working methods we're using today on day one of reset. OK, I, I'm going to ask Ray, would you like to comment on, on that? It's linked to climate change. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, Daryl, as always, you've hit the uh, uh, the nail absolutely on the head. We've learned an awful lot by what we've been going through recently. And there are many things we need to consider as we prepare for council after the relaxation of rules covering COVID-19. Smarter working will be a major consideration. Reducing mileage is high up on my list as part of our commitment to the climate change and ecological emergency declaration we made nearly a year ago. Personally, I travel 70 miles every time I go to Dorchester. Mm. That's a cost to the taxpayer of about 40 pounds. Not only is that wear and tear on me, my vehicle, but it's also money for the taxpayer to pay out. And I think by smarter working, we can save so much going forward. I've taken your point on board and we will be discussing it at the AP later this month. Thank you, Ray. Thank and you, the, Ray. The other, obviously, the other um, obvious thing is that you're not um, producing the CO2, CO2 you do now. So um, all good news. Thank you. Is that it, Daryl? That's it. Thank you, well Leader. Done. Thank you very much. Uh, Matt Hall, I've got you on the list. Are you there? I can't see him. No? No, Matt Hall. I think we're going to have to move on if Matt's not able to be with us. We've we've got some. Hello, hello. Chairman. Oh, hello. Are you there? Hi. I'm there at last. Thank right. you. Right. Um, hello, Councilor Matt. Matt Hall, um, Dorset Councillor for Sherborne West, Chairman of Audit and Governance. Um, Chairman, I have four questions. Would you like me to go through them individually or all in one go? I think you can do them all in one go because I've I think I've got someone who's going to be able to answer all your questions. OK, that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, a number of members have come to me with the question of uh, scrutiny. So it brings to the point um, 12.1. 109 decisions have been taken locally. Can the council confirm whether those decisions are what would be classed as operational or are they um, decisions which would normally go through a scrutiny process? Question two is in relation to 12.4. It was really good to see Dorset Council coming forward um, to um, assist Dorset's food banks with um, a cash uh, lump sum. 
Um, is Dorset Council continuing to keep in touch with all the food banks and to make sure that they have exactly what they are needing? Um, question three is with regards to 13.4E, which is the mental health support. The effect on mental health caused by the virus is potentially huge and long lasting. No two groups will be affected in the same way. There will be a group for who staying at home and being helped online could be classed as the easy bit. It's when things return to a form of normal without many of the online help channels that people could find themselves in more trouble. What are we as a council doing to make sure that those highlighted during this crisis will continue to get help? And the final question came from a number of residents who contacted me last night with regards to um, schools returning hopefully shortly. And that is the question of safety on school transport. Would the um, Dorset Council care to comment? Thank you. Laura, would you like to start this off? And if, you, if there's anything that you're not clear about, we'll, we'll, we'll pass it on to somebody else, but see how you get on. Yeah, sure. That's that's fine, Spencer. And thank you, Matt. I can certainly help with the first three questions. Um, I may pass to colleagues um, in children's or transport. I don't know if Andrew and Ray might want to come in um, or officers may want to chip in um, about the school transport. Because I agree that's that's going to be a, a serious consideration. Um, Matt, thank you for your um, questions and thank you for your support as well through this. We've been in touch on a number of things. You've always been really positive, so thank you for that. Um, on the first question, so um, when this crisis hit, uh, we needed to act quickly. Uh, we needed to support the local health and social care system. Uh, decisions were made at speed as fits the scenario. They were also made, importantly, they were made within the council scheme of delegation. Um, officers have maintained ongoing communication and briefings with myself and the wider cabinet. And where required, they have escalated matters to us where key decisions uh, needed to be made and were required. So that's the first question. Um, the second question with relation to the food banks, um, we've been working with Public Health Dorset to be in weekly contact with all the food banks in Dorset. And that includes those that were established previously and also the new ones that opened and responded really quickly to the coronavirus crisis. Many have seen an increase in need. They've all responded by adapting their services to allow for social distancing. Um, many of them are doing deliveries if they needed to. We've supported them. Um, if they needed food supplies, if they needed additional volunteers, financial support, we've given them grant options. We've provided guidance on shielded patients and how to support them, how to support um, and volunteer safely. We've provided lanyards so that people can be identified who are working with food banks on a voluntary basis. Uh, we provided healthy start vouchers, applications for families with young children, um, and they're providing us with weekly data on the food parcels given out so that we can map this information. We've been mapping this for about the last month. Um, all of the food banks have been absolutely fantastic. They all have supplies and they all have amazing volunteers. OK, so that was food banks. The last one um, that I'm going to answer, and I think um, for me absolutely critical, um, is the mental health support um, question. So responding to and supporting them, um, absolutely key priority, Resporting, uh, responding um, and supporting employees, the public, our communities. Um, this, this virus has had a huge impact and that is going to be a huge priority for the recovery coordination group under the local uh, resilience forum. So there's well established multi agency wellbeing and community resilience groups in place already involving Dorset Council colleagues. Um, these have delivered, uh, developed some comprehensive wellbeing offers for staff and communities. The groups are currently bringing together a tiered approach for support, which meets different sorts of needs. So that might be self-help, that might be skills training, that might be healthy lifestyle resources, counselling, uh, there might be therapy and phone line help to help with crisis, trauma, uh, bereavement. I know that some friends of mine who are struggling with their children at home have already um, have already reached out to our children's helpline. Uh, which, which is good news um, that they've got that support. So through the community resilience effort responding to COVID and working with the voluntary sector, we've also got programmes of support um, that can help people in communities with other worries, which includes access to food, financial advice and medication. So almost 
um, nipping those potential mental health issues in the bud to see if we can support with the practicalities because as we all know if your needs around food and your, your money and your medication if they are not met and you're concerned about that that can lead to huge anxiety um, and mental health impact. So we hope that by providing that initial support that people um, don't go on to develop more serious complications um, and, and that work with mental health services and our third sector partners is going to be an absolutely crucial part of recovery. Um, we need to get our communities back to a new sense of normal. We need to support our valuable people, including the super shielded, valuable families um, and young people during recovery um, because these, these people that need help, um, support, advice or therapy, um, they will need it for as long as they need it and we will be there for as long as it needs to be there. So thank you Matt, um, I think that was a really really um, important question and I hope that my answer has been helpful um, and we can certainly always stay in touch on this topic because you know it's really close to my heart. Um, I'd like to hand over to whoever wants to uh, talk about um, children and uh, safety on public oh, on school sorry transport. Thank you Chair. So shall I suggest that we hand over to Andrew Parry on that one? Andrew? Thank you, Chairman. Just a, a couple of brief comments and observations on, on the matter. Um, obviously, in respect of uh, SEND transport, a, a lot of those are very tailored individual transport arrangements, which have actually been happening whilst we are in the, the process of um, uh, isolation, because, of course, many of those pupils are remained in a school setting. In respect of uh, mainstream education, there, there are two elements to the transportation of, of pupils uh, there. There are obviously dedicated school buses which are, are solely populated by school students who would be ordinarily in the mix of a school day in, in association with one another. Um, there is, of course, those pupils that do travel uh, on public transport or a shared public transport system. Um, and obviously we are waiting to see what the uh, government guidelines are going to be in respect of social distancing in those settings and officers will be closely working to ensure that we adhere to them. So it is something that we very much are mindful of. Uh, we will we will adapt our policy and approach as we see the government advice come forward. And, and uh, you know, my invitation to Matthew on that one is, is please let us carry on a conversation because I do appreciate the role of any form of audit in how we go about that. Thank you very much, Andrew. Well, last but by no means least in this section is uh, Councillor Jane Somper. Thank you very much. Um, I uh, uh, just a few questions. One of which um, actually has already been answered, so I won't um, I won't put that one in. Um, I've got a question around homeschooled children um, who probably will have felt slightly less impact than others. Um, and I just wondered about the support that they will have received from Dorset Council. Um, have they received that and their families? And then another question on um, the placement of looked after children. Um, I know that that's an area where there's uh, um, a lot of pressure. And have those children who have recently been uh, or entered into the looked after system been placed uh, in Dorset or have they had to be placed out of the county? Thank you very much, uh, Jane, for those two questions. Andrew, can I refer to you, please? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I certainly I'll, I'll take part of this question if I may. I may also then um, defer to Theresa Levy, who may wish to give additional input uh, from the director's point of view and the operational side of it. Um, can I start, of course, by, by thanking uh, Councillor Somper for her question um, and, and also to thank her and the members of the People's Scrutiny Committee for the vital role they, they do play in supporting Dorset Council's work with children and young people. In respect of those attending um, the settings that we're talking about uh, during the lockdown period, there, there are of course some ebb and flow in the numbers that we're seeing in the school settings over the last uh, period of time. I think last week we saw 500 children who fit the DfE's definition of vulnerable who are in school. Uh, this includes around half of the initial cohort of 87. Um, our work is focused on children with social workers who have multiple vulnerabilities. Now, these children um, with a social worker who um, are looked after 
uh, and include uh, this cohort where they are homeschooled. So there is a there is still that that support link that I think you're you're seeking for me to clarify there, um, uh, Jane. Um, in respect to the children in care, um, this, the rate of the number of children we have in care hasn't increased, um, but there is a significant pressure in the placing of children within the county. Now, now Cabinet will be aware of efforts by officers from Children's Services working with our comms team to recruit more in-county foster carers, and that's an essential part of how we support uh, children uh, during this, uh, that we have a corporate responsibility for in this time. Um, the importance of a rolling programme of foster care recruitment, together with our support of uh, existing carers, is to develop the skills and retain their expertise. Uh, and in respect of um, members of the corporate parenting board in particular, will continue to monitor closely. Now, it, it should be said, looking ahead, we have a number of planned admissions into our care system over the next few weeks. That, of course, does provide its own set of challenges, but we are confident that we can care for those children. Uh, as we currently are. Um, I do have a concern that in terms of general costs, any new placements we see coming in will increase whilst avail availability is decreasing. Uh, this is a serious concern, especially in regard to secure accommodation, of which there is a na nationwide shortage. Um, I hope I have be, you know, uh, some, somewhat explained uh, or answered Councillor Somper's question. Theresa Levy um, may wish to comment further. Theresa, do you want to add anything to Andrew, what Andrew said? Thank you, Spencer. Yes, and, and, and thank you, Councillor Sumter. That's a really helpful questions, and they are the most vulnerable, aren't they, that we're looking at, and, and those most um, excluded and socially isolated. So education at home, absolutely, as, as Councillor Power has described, those are a group of children that we've been looking at prioritising pre-COVID and that we're continuing to work with, and they remain where they have a social worker on our most vulnerable list, and we're looking to access both school curriculum to those young people, and the way in which we're doing that is by schools are contacting all children on those vulnerable lists on a weekly basis, many of them more, more often than that, in fact, and we are too, and continuing face-to-face -face visiting where that's appropriate. And that's appropriate both for those families and for our staff, and we're managing that very carefully, as you'd appreciate. The issue of placements is, as, as we were, and I think as, as we've gone into COVID, is, is really challenging. So across the country, about 50% of the marketplace are no longer admitting children. That has had a significant challenge for us as an authority, along with every other authority in the country. Again, as Councillor Parry refers to, there are presently no secure care beds across the country. And today, 51 local authorities, including us, are seeking one of those beds. So we are in a challenging position, but what I can assure you is that wherever we have been needing to bring a young person into our care, we have given as much wraparound support to those young people and kept as many of them locally as we possibly can. It is a challenge. It was a challenge as we went into COVID and it remains a challenge. We are absolutely, and we have pushed ahead with our fostering recruitment. That may have seemed odd to people, but what we know about recruitment is that there is often a time lag between people becoming, starting to think about it and actually signing up anyway. So it was a perfectly sensible thing to do. And where we can, we're starting some of those assessments electronically. So we're not sort of activating interest and not being able to progress people. But we do also have um, at least 20 of our fostering households where there is a shielded member. And so we have to review those households now to ask ourselves questions about the suitability of continuance for those placements. And for some, the answer will be yes, and some it may be otherwise. And we also clearly are losing some capacity within that position as people won't be able to take placements whilst they're shielding. So it is a challenging space. Um, we have a daily meeting of our operational leaders and the corporate director, Alison Montgomery, is leading that meeting to look at our most vulnerable young people and to ensure that where we can, in these times we avoid young people becoming into our care where they are that we have really robust plans for them thank you very much Teresa, and thank you very much jane for your questions they were, they were very sound and um, before we move on i'm conscious of the fact that uh, jill mentioned scrutiny and i wanted to invite jonathan mayor just to say a few words around that leader thank you um i think it was councillor matt hall asked a question about um scrutiny of the decisions um the number of decisions that were listed in the cabinet report as as having been made during during the emergency and he was concerned about how how those are scrutinized 
scrutiny is incredibly important and in ordinary times um, scrutiny would be carried out in one of two ways it would be carried out pre-decision and councillors would have an opportunity to contribute um, to, to a decision as, as part of scrutiny and how the decision was going to be made or scrutiny would come about after the event and councillors would uh, look back at how a decision had been made in in the emergency situation that we're we're in and a, a very dynamic situation it's not always possible um, to involve people before you make a decision uh, when Aidan Dunn as the gold officer goes to the strategic coordinating group and sits down with the police and fire and other agencies he can't necessarily refer to other people outside the room when an important decision needs to be made so I think we're in a position here because of the nature of the emergency where scrutiny is going to have to be scrutiny after the event um, that reflects the recommendations in, in your report this morning and what you can be assured of is that, that there are records of how decisions ha have been made um, and so when you come to undertake scrutiny and look back at those decisions we'll be able to say how a decision was made why it was made thank you chairman Thank you very much, Jonathan, for putting that clarity around that point. That's a good point made. Um, before I move to the recommendation, I'm conscious that uh, Peter Worth um, would like to come in at this point. Peter? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, may I first of all also extend my thanks to everybody. I know that all the employees I've talked to have been working huge hours and I'm very, very grateful. We would like to replace the recommendation that's in the report with a revised recommendation, <coughs> excuse me, that has four elements. The first element is that the council's response to the COVID emergency response is noted. The second is that all council staff be thanked for their part in responding to the emergency. The third is that this report is referred to the Resources Overview and Scrutiny Committee for members to consider the effectiveness of Dorset Council's response. And the fourth item is that the focus of the work of the Resources Overview and Scrutiny Committee should be to learn from Dorset Council's experience of responding to the COVID-19 emergency and not to scrutinise the effectiveness of other agencies and any decisions which are rightly the responsibility of the council's partners. So that's in four items and I move that amendment. Thank you very much, Peter. I'll leave that on the table for a moment. I just want to, uh, first of all, I'm going to summarise, but I want to thank all the contributors this morning. Um, it's been excellent. I mean, it's a very, very good report. It is sort of a snap, as someone said earlier, I think it was Matt Prosser or somebody said it was a, a snapshot of where we are. We're not over this by any means yet, but I, I want to thank all those that um, re contributed to the, re to the creation of the report and of course to our partners, the NHS, the CCG, police, fire and rescue, our MPs, but in the main, you know, our residents and businesses. That's it's, uh, helping us handle this challenge of this global pandemic. So basically, Colleagues, we are where we are on this. It's a, a very important report that's going to go off to, to scrutiny with the amended recommendations. So can I can I ask if there's, um, anybody wishes to abstain or vote against? Or can I or can I take it that we're all in favour? Agreed. 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 Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you very much again for all your contributions. So we're now going to move on to um, some other items that came out of our forward plan. And the first one is the approval of the um, of the transfer of assets to Portland Town Council. And I'm going to hand over to Tony Ferrari. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Tony Ferrari, um, Portfolio Holder for Finance, Commercial and Assets. Um, we've been thanking lots of officers for the work that they've been doing on the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, need to thank them for carrying on doing business as usual. This is uh, just the work of the council and thank them for keeping these parts of the council rolling while we're doing all the other things that we're doing. This paper is called approval of transfer of assets and it sounds like a transaction between um, Dorset Council and Portland Town Council but it's actually the last act of the formation of the unitary. Weymouth and Portland um, District Council fulfilled a range of functions and owned a range of assets and those that went to Weymouth Town Council were broken out 
of the Weymouth and Portland Town Council when Weymouth Town Council and Dorset Councils were both formed. But because these assets were going to an already existing body, Portland Town Council, we had to go through a different legal process. So this asset transfer is effectively been pre-agreed by the um, Shadow Council before the formation of Dorset Council and this is actually just the implementation of the policy that they agreed, agreed by both Dorset Council and Portland Town Council um, and I uh, commend it to Cabinet. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, Tony. Any comments from anyone? It all seems pretty straightforward and as Tony said, a little his historic in many ways, but uh, an important uh, day to, to deal with this particular matter. If I hear nobody, so I will go on to say that uh, we've got a recommendation before us. Uh, does anyone wish to abstain or vote against? If not, are you all in favour? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Right, thank you very much. We move on to agenda item nine, Transforming Cities Fund. Um, Ray Bryan. Yes, uh, I'm Councillor Ray Bryan. My portfolio covers uh, uh, highways, travel and the environment and obviously also the uh, climate and ecological uh, emergency that we declared. Right, the Transforming Cities Fund is funding of 79 million that has been re secured relating to cycling, walking and bus infrastructure improvements within BCP and the surrounding Dorsal Council areas most notably Ferndown and Wimborne. This council's share of the costs are 950,000 over three years. There's 50,000 in 2021, 450,000 in 21-22, 450,000 in 22-23. This money is already coming from our local transport plan block fundings settlement and developer contributions. This money is already available. Through our, through our normal process. The funding from central government has to be spent within a three year window starting from April 2020. The also council has one of the first schemes that expected to come forward at Lee Road, which we hope to commence in the autumn of this year. Other schemes will be designed and delivered over the three year period in close coordination with scheme delivery teams within the BCP area. Before making this determination in relation to local authorities in England, the Minister did obtain consent from the Treasury on this process. Communication and engagement strategies have been worked up at the TCF, uh, the Council Governance Board, uh, and we held meetings last Friday. Both Councillor Parks and myself sit on that board, and if Councillor uh, Parks is not available, then we've allocated Councillor Adkins, who will then deputy de deputise. As I say, the first board meeting took place last Friday. All this is part of our ongoing efforts to modernise our transport infrastructure, provide high quality infrastructure for walking, cycling and those with mobility impairments. It will also help reduce car use on short to medium trips provide an environment where people can incorporate exercise into their daily lives with the resulting possible impact on physical and mental health. It will improve air quality, provide better access to education and employment. We have a real opportunity to redesign our road space within the TCF area to properly provide for all road users and not just those in cars or other vehicles. The wide road corridors in much of Ferndown and the surrounding area make this achievable. The recommendations in front of you are in three parts. One is to approve in principle the proposed three year delivery program in line with TCF strategic outline business case already approved by Cabinet and guidance set out by the DFT in the assurance framework. B approves the pro proposed government finance framework and delegates authority to the head of highways in consultation with the portfolio holder for highways, travel and environment through the TCF Council Governance Board for approval of future TCF proposals, detailed program the delivery decisions and the detailed design of each element of the program. And recommendation C approves the principle of regular TCF update reports going to the CGB 
and from there to the DFT as stipulated within point eight of the award letter with consideration of traffic regulation orders associated with the programme being considered in line with the current Dorset Council's approval. I, I recommend this to the to, to the to the uh, cabinet. Thank you very much, Ray. Before we um, go to a debate, I've got the note here that Daryl Turner wanted to uh, to make a comment. Daryl. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, there's one quick one on a appendix two, which is the governance structure. And I just thought um, that there is no mention there of any type of scrutiny function within that structure chart. And I just wondered perhaps a joint scrutiny with BCP to ensure transparency um, throughout the work and throughout the spend would be appropriate. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, observation, Daryl. Can I suggest that we uh, we take that away and have a look at the uh, beyond today? We'll have a look at what the structure is and if there's a need to to make an amendment, I'm more happy to do that. You know how strongly I feel about the need for scrutiny across all the things that we do. And um, yes, I'm happy to take that away. Are you content with that? Thank you, very content, thank you. Yeah, good. Cabinet colleagues, anything to add to what raised some? Um, very eloquently put across. He managed to read all the recommendations that I might have had to do myself. So thank you for that. Any comments, anyone? It all looks pretty good to me. Agreed. Uh, content. Good. So basically all in favour, yes? Yes. Yep. Thank yeah. you very much. We go on to agenda item 10, endorsement of the Dorset and East Devon Coastal World Heritage Site Partnership Plan. Very snappy, Ray. Just give me a second. Um, yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, the report before you is on pages 175 to 234. Uh, and I would say we are particularly lucky to live in such a beautiful part of the country. The numerous designated countryside and coastal areas attest to the special and unique environment in which we find ourselves. The Jurassic Coast World Heritage Site is one designation, but an extremely important one being the only natural world heritage site in England. Of course, there are significant social, economic and environmental benefits to such a designation. In 2015, a study determined, determined that an estimated 111 million is generated in the economy and up to 2,000 jobs because of the World Heritage Site designation. Linked cultural events, in, in, interpretation, educational work and ongoing protection of the site has had a wider positive impact on Dorset and East Devon. Being on the World Heritage List means that those responsible for managing World Heritage property sites have a common obligation to ensure that they are protected for present and future generations, not just through legal means, but through responsible, inclusive, sustainable management practices. The Jurassic Coast World Heritage Site therefore must have an agreed management stroke partnership plan in place. This latest it iteration of the site management plan, the Jurassic Coast Partnership Plan, has been widely consulted upon. The approach taken to its development is set around partnership working, which is also key to its delivery. Dorset Council's corporate priorities are clearly being met here. The existence and active management of the World Heritage Site provides an environment that attracts business, investment and tourism. Policies aim to improve access to our coast, countryside and green spaces, and to protect our natural, historic and cultural environments. They build and celebrate community pride in our unique environment. Since 2017, the Jurassic Coast Trust has taken the lead in setting out and coordinating delivery of site management, delivering the obligations of both Dorset Council and Devon County Council in respect of site management. We are now funding at a level of 120,000 per annum with 80,000 coming from Dorset Council and 40 from Devon County Council. Whilst the councils are still the major funders, a number of other funding sources now contribute towards the Jurassic Coast team budget. For every pound we contribute to the trust, they are able to generate three to four pound in charitable contributions and project funding, making this a cost effective model for site management. Continued financial support towards core site core site management operations of the trust is critical while the trust becomes firmly established and it's recommended that Dorset Council and Devon County Council continue to fund at the, excuse me, at the current level 
until March 2023. The alternative would be for Dorset Council to once again host a site management team which would be less cost effective and potentially limit opportunities to access external funding, attract volunteers and recruit sponsors to support site management. The recommendations in three parts and I ask the Cabinet to accept the recommendations as listed on page 175 of the agenda. Thank you very much, Ray, for a really comprehensive overview of what this re this paper is all about. Now, I've got a couple of people that wish to speak before I open the debate. Daryl Turner, you're one. Thank you, Chairman. Just a very quick one again. Um, I've looked at both the report and the plan um, and see little reference to marketing. We have one of the most valued sites in the country. Um, and I think we could could this element be strengthened? Could we increase the marketing presence in those reports? Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Ray, do you want to comment? Yes, um, I, I spoke to Ken Buchan on this uh, earlier on today, um, Daryl, and he and he tells me that a good proportion of the management plan is focused around promotion of the site, in particular in the section protecting the world's heritage site with strategic aims to inspire and engage people with the site and deepen their understanding of its values to maintain and improve access to an experience of the site and enabling the site's world heritage status to be of benefit. The site is promoted by the trust, but it's also its business partners and ambassadors. The day to day work on this is carried out by the Jurassic Coast Trust, and I will pass your comments on to the management team and discuss their future communications strategy and we'll forward a response to, on this to you at a later date, if you're happy with that, Daryl. Very happy, thank you. Thank you very much for the question, Daryl. I've got Matt Hall wants to ask a question, I think. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I've got um, similar issues as raised by Daryl, but I wanted also to raise something else. Um, I'm, I'm quite knowledgeable of this whole Jurassic Coast. Um, the Dorset part, I think, in general is excellent. But across the border into East Devon, there is quite a substantial problem with uh, cliff falls. There's quite a problem with the uh, pedestrian walkways getting really quite close to, to the edge of the cliffs. And it, it can just be seen by some, if you read this report, that councils are spending out money, but they're not necessarily seeing the work on the ground. So I, I'm, I suppose I'm just after some reassurance that we feel that this um, walk through time is is being protected and is being looked after properly, if you see what I mean. Thank you. So, thank you, Matt. Ray. Yeah, I think in, in fair, thank you for the uh, uh, question, Matt. I think uh, uh, I, I will be having conversations with my colleague in, in Devon on, on, what, on the problems that you've just raised. Uh, because I wasn't aware of them. Um, I will deal with this and if I can, I'll come back to you at a later date with the responses I received from Devon, if you're happy with that. That's happy brilliant. That. Thank you, Ray. Yeah, brilliant. Good. Well Thank done. You. Thank you very much for the questions. Right, members, we've got this report in front of us. Ray's given us an overview, brought our attention to the recommendations. Are there any abstentions or voting against or can we all, can we agree? I'm agreed. 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 Thank agreed. you very much, everyone. Now we've got some um, three neighbourhood plans to deal with now. I'm going to hand over to David Walsh. He's going to deal with agenda item 11. Thank you, Chairman. Um, <clears throat> during agenda item 7, when I said this previously, um, my tongue forgot how to speak, so I would clearly like to say it again for anyone worried about the state of neighbourhood plans at present. A great deal of time and hard work has been put into neighbourhood planning in many of our communities. And I'm incredibly pleased to be able to say that such dedication has been recognised and planning guidance changed nationally. Because regulations linked to the Coronavirus Act 2020 mean that no elections or referendums can take place until the 6th of May 2021. This includes neighbourhood planning referendums. And so current planning guidance has been updated to set out that neighbourhood plans awaiting referendums can be given significant weight in decision making. Now that's a great step forward. With regards to the next three items, I will be taking them individually because the amount of work they've done deserves that. And so agenda item 11 is the making of the Bridport Area Neighbourhood Plan 2020 to 2036. The Bridport Area Neighbourhood Plan has recently been subject to independent examination and a successful referendum. 
The purpose of this report is to make the Bridport Area Neighbourhood Plan part of the development plan for use in planning decisions in the Bridport Neighbourhood Area. The parishes of Allington, Bothenhampton, Waldwich, Bradpool, Bridport and Simmonsbury. Where a referendum results in more than half those voting in favour of the proposal, the Council must adopt the plan as soon as reasonably practical unless it considers that this would breach or be incompatible with any EU obligation or any of the Convention rights. Today I am recommending to Cabinet that we formally adopt the Bridport Area Neighbourhood Plan as part of the statutory development plan for the Bridport Neighbourhood Area. In addition to recognise the significant amount of work undertaken by the Joint Council Committee in preparing the Neighbourhood Plan, congratulating them on their success. Thank you Chairman. Thank you very much David. Comments from anyone or I, I think this is a, another example of a good piece of work done by lots of volunteers locally. Can we agree? Agree. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you Agreed. very much. Agenda item 12, David. Thank you, Chairman. This is the making of the Upper Marshwood Neighbourhood Plan 2018 to 2033. The Upper Marshwood Vale Neighbourhood Plan has recently been subject to independent examination and a successful referendum. The purpose of this report is to make the Upper Marshwood Vale Neighbourhood Plan part of the development plan for use in planning decisions in the Upper Marshwood Vale Neighbourhood area, which encompasses the parishes of Marshwood, Stoke Abbott, Pilsden and Betterscombe. Today I'm recommending to Cabinet that we formally adopt the Upper Marshwood Vale Neighbourhood Plan as part of the statutory development plan for the Upper Marshwood Vale Neighbourhood area. In addition, to recognise the significant amount of work undertaken by the Upper Marshwood Vale Neighbourhood Plan Group in preparing the Neighbourhood Plan and congratulating them on their success. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, David. I think we'd all echo the sentiment you've just expressed about the work they've done. Comments from anybody or can we agree? Agreed. 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 Gone to agenda Agreed. item 13, David. Agenda item 13. This is the third one that got in before the lockdown, the referendum. So this is the making of the Sutton Points Neighbourhood Plan 2016 to 2031. The Sutton Points Neighbourhood Plan has recently been subject to independent examination and a successful referendum. The purpose of this report is to make the Sutton Points Neighbourhood Plan part of the development area plan for use in planning decisions in the Sutton Points Neighbourhood area. Chairman, I would like to propose the recommendations and I think someone else wishes to speak. Thank you very much, David. Comments from anyone? Uh, I'd like to speak, please, uh, please Chair. Yes, Tony yes, Ferrari. Indeed, Tony. Yep. Yeah, Tony Ferrari speaking in this occasion as Ward Councillor of Sutton Points and member of the Sutton Points Neighbourhood Plan Steering Committee from the first meeting to the last. Um, I'd just like to offer my thanks to the enormous number of people who partook in the creation of this plan. Lots and lots of them on the committees and the subcommittees. All of the people who attended all of the uh, consultations and open days and all of the people who voted on it. Um, however, they voted at the end of the plan. I thought it was a fantastic example of democratic engagement. Um, a small community taking some influence on the way it moves forward. Thank you. Well, well said, Tony. Any other comments or can we agree? Agreed. 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 Thank you very much. Agenda item 14, Ray, which is the Climate and Ecological Emergency Executive Advisory Panel update. Anything to add? Uh, the only thing I'm going to add is just to make sure everybody still realises how important this is to the Council. And the fact that you've uh, allowed me to continue the EAP, which I thank you for, just shows that the importance is held at the highest level within this Council and we will do everything we can uh, to get the uh, the reports to the full council um, in the uh, in, in the latter part of this year. Thank you very much, Ray. We're now going to move into exempt business. Peter Wolf, would you like to move exempt, please? Certainly will. Thank you. I certainly will. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'd like to move the exclusion of the press and the public for the following item in view of the likely disclosure of exempt information within the meaning of paragraph three of schedule 12A to the Local Government Act 1972 as amendment as amended. I propose that. Everybody agreed? Agreed. agreed. Can I just say now that uh, for the benefit of the public and anybody else that's listening, we're going to be logging out of the uh, Teams live event and we're then going to go into a re-log in in a closed session. But uh, thank you very much, everybody, for being part of what's happened today. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.